Hey everybody, how is it going? Um, sorry we're running a little late. It's because of um, this problem that you can see right here, where Matt's uh, camera is not working. When we did a, oh, well, and I have I'm echoing because I have the stream up. Man, this is a mess. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So we recorded on Tuesday, and Matt's uh, camera was doing this, and we kind of figured it was just a one-time thing. And it uh, appears not to be. So we're, we're trying to work through this, but we wanted to at least get on to say hey so you guys know why we we haven't started yet. So hello, everyone. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Um, so here's what we're going to do, Matt. If you can't figure that out, I'm just going to go to your facebook and i'm gonna get a picture of you <laughs> we're just gonna stick it on the podcast or the thing am i quieter i can uh i can turn me up if i need to I, turn me up yeah we haven't calibrated me yet either so Do, 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 do. I am turning me up a little bit. Just a little bit. I don't want to do it too much. Um, okay. Let's do this. I'm just going to get a, a good picture of Matt. No, that's... You're not... I used the one we used when we had this problem last time. Okay. Matt. Uh. I already have a Matt on here. <laughs> I wonder if that's... Hey, that's a big mat. We'll fix that mat. There, pro problem problem solved. You're you're here. <laughs> Yay! Oh boy. Yeah. Um, the the sorts of things it's suggesting are basically like reinstall Skype. So I'm like, yeah, I, I don't want to do that right now. So um, let's just I guess just go on with this solution that you have created. Yeah. Um. Let me uh. Let me do a quick. Quick check on your voice. Go ahead and talk for me. <clears throat> All right. I am talking and going to continue talking and just talking until. <laughs> I think you need to be a little bit louder. Stop talking. Yeah. Okay. I think you're yep. good. Um, I'm going to turn on. I'm going to hit record on my recording device. Me too. All right. The recording is happening. Let me get situated here so we can actually start this. Sorry, guys. We usually try to start these ones um, a little bit, a little bit uh, more. A little bit on timer. <laughs> well, just not, just not even like when we do the the worm recording. It's like it's just for it's just private, and we yeah. try to make this like an actual show, yeah. and it. Uh, <clears throat> it's not going it's not going it's okay well, but... you can still trim the video so that oh, we are show absolutely all this. gonna do that <laughs> um i'm gonna i'm gonna block your well, i guess we can't do that unless you hang up because now i just have this you um skype window that's popping up that 
There's uh. nothing. All right. Are you ready? Yep. All right, let's go. In five, four, three, two, one. Hello and welcome to the Daily Planet Book Club, our monthly live stream discussion of a book chosen by you, our listeners. I have many names and many forms, but you may call me Scott Daly, and I am joined once again by this month, this month by the King of America, Matt Freeman. Matt, how is it going? Um, it's going well as far as I can tell. I'm just not sure if I really exist. Um, well, so, so that's hard to deal with. <laughs> well, if only there was some kind of book that could tell us that. Wait, but does it? But does it? Does, does it? Do you believe in me? Uh, I believe in many things, and okay. it's okay that they're contradictory things. Okay, all right. Then I guess we can move on. So how is everyone doing? We have a bunch of people in chat here. We have Vale, we have Sammy, we have Prof, we have Sergey. Um, I don't see anyone in the Discord chat talking yet, but if you're listening in there, say hello. Welcome, guys. I am excited about doing this book. I've been looking forward to this month, uh, this month's book club all month. Um, and I, I think we have a lot to say. We have a, a ton of slides. I, I kept I kept my limit down, Matt. I think I cheated by one slide. I think I gave myself one more than I needed. Um, but all right, we'll let it slide this time because this is your <laughs> this is one you've been looking forward to. Did you? I think that's fair. Was was we'll let it slide, like intentional or? Um, of course. <laughs> You should have just yeah yeah you should have you should have just <laughs> earnestly taken credit for that yeah yeah all uh, right um yeah. let's 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 do it let's go into yeah. it yeah yeah um so yeah the, for for those of you um joining us here for the first time uh um welcome um here's a quick primer on how this thing works each month Scott and I select five books submitted to us by all you guys. And we put up a poll for all the supporters on Patreon and let them vote on which they'd like us to talk about. Uh, the book with the most votes wins. That's and right. And we all read it. Oh, sorry. I, I jumped the gun on that. <laughs> we, we meet up on the last Friday of every month and then we chat about the book. Um, this is a fully interactive experience. We There's a reason we live stream these instead of just having a, a podcast. It's because we want to talk to you guys about the book. So, um, we are going to be, if you're listening on the podcast version, we are going to be talking to people as they have comments and questions, and uh, we're going to make this a conversation, not just two people sitting here droning on about the book. Um, mm -hmm. Matt, what are we doing this month? What is this month's book? Well, this month, you guys voted for American Gods by Neil Gaiman, or, or Gaiman. I think it's Gaiman. I think I'm it's pretty Gaiman. sure it's Gaiman. I was I went to Starbucks today. I was working on this today, and I had the book in my hand, uh -huh. and and I got thrown for a loop because the woman at the Starbucks counter said said, uh, like, Gaiman, and uh -huh. I was just not I was just not mentally prepared for it. And it's one of those things where someone's talking to you, but you don't like process what they're saying, so you're <laughs> just like awkwardly staring at them. Uh, that was that was my experience. I'm really good at being social. Yeah. Well. What's funny is that if that scene had happened in this book, then it would probably mean something. I think um, you're right. But yeah, this will be our second Gaimon book uh, on on this show. <laughs> uh, so clearly, you guys are big fans of of the Gaiman. Gaiman. See, Matt's. <sighs> I'm sorry. I'm not doing I, it on purpose. Now. I spelled now it confused. wrong. I spelled it wrong when I was typing, and that is <laughs> you absolutely doing it on purpose. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, from goodreads.com days before his release from prison shadow's wife laura dies in a mysterious car crash numbly he makes his way back home on the plane he encounters the enigmatic mr wednesday who claims to be a refugee from a distant war a former god and the king of america together they embark on a profoundly strange journey across the heart of the usa whilst all around them a storm of preternatural and epic proportions threatens to break that's an interesting Goodreads summary because former God. Yeah. And also, he, does Wednesday ever call himself the King of America? I don't know if he does. I'm pr I'm pretty sure he doesn't. Yeah. Um. So that's weird. 
Uh-huh. That Goodreads normally steers us right, but I don't know about this time. All right, Matt, before we get into our slides and into this discussion, I want to know what you overall thought of American Gods. Had you read it before? And uh, what was what was the experience like? So I, I had read it before um, many years ago. And I, I remember enjoying it quite a bit. I remember there being a couple of things about it that stuck in my craw. Didn't make me dislike it. Uh, just, just it, it, it was the kind of experience where whenever I thought about the book, I tended to think about those, uh, those things that kind of left me a little, a little um, dissatisfied. Uh, but that time and this time, it was, it was a very, very fun reading experience. It's a book that, that kind of sprawls and um almost all the time that's a good thing in, in this case it's you 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 kind of are luxuriating in the story there's a lot of characters there's a lot of twists and turns and things that happen and um it, it's kind of a fun book to just soak in if if you know what i mean yeah i do i do um i agree with you i read this book i think it's been uh, it was exactly a year because i remember i was on my honeymoon and I was reading this on a train in Europe, reading about America. Um, <laughs> and I remember finishing the book and then reaching out to you because I know you had told me that you were kind of mixed on it. And and I, I pretty much agreed at the time that, that there were a lot of things I liked, but there were some things that really bothered me. And this time, I think this reread really settled me on, I really, really love this book. I, I, I think it's phenomenal. And I think that the things that bothered me the first time bother me even more now that I've realized I love the book because it's like, I just wish the things could be just, just a little bit better. Right. Like it, it's just like, and, and, and I don't know, like the interesting part is if those things are fixed, maybe I wouldn't like the book as much. That's the weirdest thing about this is you're, you're right. It's sprawling. This is a book exploring a lot of different things. Um, the, the main thrust of the plot is pretty secondary to the things that Gaiman wants to say about um, America and its people. And some of the, the, the plot movements get a little abandoned in that, but I think he does it intentionally. Yeah. I, I agree that all of the stuff that I don't like about the book is intentional, which makes it like you said, difficult to protest because you're like, well, I guess I'm just not reading it right. Uh, but I think we, I think we'll get lots of opportunities to talk about exactly what we mean. I will say that there was one thing that made the first reading experience very difficult for me, which then completely went away for the second reading experience. But I'll mention that when we get to slide five, uh, and that will become clear. All right. So with that said, let's get into it. Let's talk American Gods. I will say that out of all the books we've done for this sh uh, this book club since we started, which we're coming up on a year, Matt. Can you believe it? I can't. Uh -huh. I can't believe it. We're coming wow. up on a year of this thing. Um, out of all the books we've done for this, this was one of the hardest for me to pare down the slides. I really feel like we could do a whole like ten part show on this book because there's just so much going on and there's so many different things and 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 I think Gaiman pretty expertly like instills his themes in just about every interaction. So it's like really deciding what we're going to focus on and what we're not was very difficult for me. And I, I almost like, I almost like don't think I did like, as I was writing the summaries for the areas between the slides, I was like, Oh, I wish we could have like talked about that a little more, but there's just no, there's just no time. It's, it's really hard. So um, we're going to try to get as to as much as we can here without making this like a six hour thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it has, I don't even know how many, like, acts, um, prof Four, technically. in the, in the channel, uh, mentions that it is indeed Gaiman. Oh, good. I, I'm glad I'm right. And you, yeah. barista at coffee shop, you were wrong. <laughs> Sorry yes. for my awkward interaction. <laughs> All right, let's begin at the beginning. In the beginning, it it was too far away for Shadow to focus on. Then it became a distant beam of hope, and he learned how to tell himself, this too shall pass. When the prison shit went down as prison shit always did, one day the magical door would open and he'd walk through it. So he marked off the days in his Songbirds of North America calendar, which was the only calendar they sold in the prison commissary, and the sun went down and he didn't see it, and the sun came up and he didn't see it. He practiced coin tricks from a book he found in the wasteland of the prison library, and he worked out. 
and he made lists in his head of what he'd do when he got out of prison. Shadow's lists got shorter and shorter. After two years, he had it down to three things. First, he was going to take a bath, a real long, serious soak in a tub with bubbles in it. Maybe read the paper, maybe not. Some days he thought one way, some days the other. Second, he was going to towel himself off, put on a robe, maybe slippers. He liked the idea of slippers. If he smoked, he would be smoking a pipe about now, but he didn't smoke. He would pick his wife in his arms. Puppy, she would squeak in mock horror and real delight. What are you doing? He would carry her to the bedroom and close the door. They'd call out for pizzas if they got hungry. Third, after he and Laura came out of the bedroom, maybe a couple days later, he was going to keep his head down and stay out of trouble the rest of his life. And then you'll be happy, added Loki Lysmith. Call no man happy, said Shadow, until he is dead. So, Matt, this is our introduction to our protagonist, Shadow, and I really wanted to use this slide to talk about Shadow in a lot of detail, because I think Shadow is both one of the best parts and the worst parts of this book simultaneously. <laughs> yeah, um, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yeah, he's, um, like, by design, Shadow is a very um, boring person person <laughs> like he's not very emotional he doesn't talk very much um he's very he's pretty passive he's like the large quiet guy he's he is a shadow that's what he is he is a, a person that just kind of either goes with the flow or follows what one person says i think the the, the we're going to talk about laura a lot in this book because she's very important but the nickname puppy i think is one of the most um the biggest things that jumped out to me the first time I read this book, because it's, it's this thing that on the surface feels like this cutesy nickname, but you realize the more you learn about their relationship and the kind of person Laura is that it's really kind of derogatory. It's like, you are my little puppy that follows me around and does whatever I say. And like, it has no agency for yourself. Um, I think like her calling him puppy. And we, we do that right here at the beginning. We define that right here at the beginning that that's his nickname really really paints a picture of who shadow is right away yeah and he continues to be this way he he wants you know here in the very beginning he wants to get out of prison but after he gets out of prison he doesn't really want anything and usually your protagonist is driven by some some desire some need and for like you said for most of this book he's reacting he's following people around he's doing what he's told I mean, explicitly, he makes a deal to just be somebody's servant, basically. And yeah. uh, so, you know, I, I think that there's a there's a duality there, which is perhaps intentional. And that's one of the things that becomes confusing is I, I find that in some situations he'll be passive and then in other situations he'll be he'll be active and almost like admirable and heroic in a way that comes off as a bit clashing Um but it also makes you like him. So th that's the thing is it's hard for me to say if he's going to be a passive character with no agency, then why does he, uh, you know, pick a fight with this character in this later scene? Well, if he didn't do stuff like that, you probably wouldn't like him very much. So yeah. I think there's a balancing act there. Well, um, and spoilers for the end of the book, we learn that Shadow is is the god Balder later in the story. And Balder is the god that everybody liked he's the one that people just like being around and he gets along with everyone and that's kind of what we're doing with shadow throughout this book we're showing like people like him and we don't really ever understand why they do because he's just kind of there but that's all part like that's what's so confusing about this book is it's not like neil gaiman just said or just wrote a bad character it's like neil gaiman wrote a character specifically to be like this like this is this is the way he wanted to define the character and a lot of this story is Shadow um, finding himself. I mean, we learn later that Shadow is not his name. And it, it's not that, oh, his name is secretly Balder. It's like, I don't think we ever learn what his, like, human name is, right? Because, no. like, the name, the name Shadow, the, the book specifically says the name Shadow was given to him just because he would follow people around all the time. He, like, like there was Shadow when he was a kid. That's what he did. And so they gave him that name. Um, and... That's just that's just kind of the person he is. Yeah. But I mean, but there is a likability under here, and I like the, it sets it up right here. Like this list of things he wants to do is a very relatable list. Like I'm gonna get clean, I'm gonna wear, wear a robe and and do it with my wife, and then I'm just gonna stay out of trouble forever. Yeah. Another and a kind of likable aspect of his character that's very noticeable is 
you know, he's, he's, he's really good at making small talk with people in a, in a very passive, but entirely pleasant way where, you know, he'll, he'll say things that are just like silence filling things to say. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, like, like, yeah, yeah, don't I know it, you know, just like meaningless sort of small talk sounds that normal people say all the time, but he does it so often that it becomes like a, a, a pretty prominent character trait of his. Yeah. So one of the things that we're introduced to in this opening scene is his cellmate, Loki Lysmith, who obviously becomes someone very important later in the book. And I'm a little bit curious here because I read this book, you listen to it. That's kind of how we normally do it. I know you, you had read this already, but was the way the audiobook said Loki, I mean, did it make that very obvious? Because I feel like when I was reading, I hadn't put two and two together until the first time I was talking about it with someone and I said Loki out loud. And I was like, oh, damn it. <laughs> um, so so I'm pretty sure I definitely did not get it when I was reading it um, years ago. And that's because when they introduce this character, you don't really know what you're getting into with this story. So you're that's not true. primed yeah. to expect it. But on the audiobook, it just sounds like Loki Lysmith when he says it. <laughs> yeah, I was I wondering mean, I was wondering if the audiobook like tries to to slow he, it down a little bit to put a space in there to say like low key Lysmith. Honestly, he kind of does, but it almost is comically obvious because it's like you're speaking at a normal cadence like this, and then you say low key Lysmith. And then your <laughs> your attention is drawn to it and you're like, Why did you say it that way? So so yeah, he, he did actually try to try to do it. Um, but it, uh, didn't work. I don't think, I don't know though. Cause you know, obviously I was rereading it. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Um, one of the things that this book does really well, I think is that for the most part, the mythology of these gods is not something that Gaiman is interested in. And we could make a whole show out of pointing out every single reference and talking about who that God is and what the meaning of, uh, what their story is and what, what the meaning of that is. I don't think we have time to do that. So that's probably something we're just not going to do. But I think that's something I enjoy about the book is that you don't have to have like cursory knowledge of all these gods to understand what's going on in the book. It, it might help. Um, and it might encourage you to go back and look up the stuff on your own, but it is not necessary for the book. Yeah. I mean, apparently Gaiman wrote a whole book literally called Norse mythology, like a, non yeah. a nonfiction book, as far as I can tell. It's, um, um it's I, I've read it. Um, okay. It's it's kind of geared toward YA, so it's like a very simplified version of Norse myths. I see. And it's it's, I mean, it's fiction in that it's just the telling of a lot of the most famous Norse myths. Um, okay. So it it like he he writes it as if it's a novel. Um, yeah. It's quite good. It's a really quick read. I read it in like an hour. So, okay. Um, I That's would cool. I would check it out. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of the, um. A lot of the the Norse stuff I know is from Marvel, <laughs> which is yeah. not accurate. So <laughs> it's good seeing some of the actual mythology behind the characters. Yeah, I mean, it, it 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 you're exactly right though that for all that he is obviously very interested in these stories, he doesn't put a lot of the detail into the book. He he hints at it, but it's not very prominent. Yeah, well, I think the the goal of the book is not to learn the mythology of these old gods. It's just it's to show how uh, the bringing of this mythology to this new place and how this place doesn't really mesh with it. Yep. So that was not his goal. A prof says it would be a two hour uh, podcast on itself. If we just talked about the gods. Yes, you're right. You're right. And yeah. Sammy says, I spent too much time on Wikipedia while reading this. I did the same thing, honestly, the first time I read it, um, just out of, out of mild curiosity, not because I felt like I was lost. I, n I never felt lost. I just wanted to know, like, I know that I know you're referencing something here game and I just don't know what it is. Right, yeah, I mean, like, I'd, I'd, I'd heard of the Norse gods. I'd never heard of Anansi the Spider or no. whatever, so. And and a lot of the, uh, the, some of the Eastern European gods that we'll, we'll see in a bit, I had never specifically heard of some of them. Yeah, me neither. So, oh. yeah, so we move on, um, and the next thing that happens is uh, two days before Shadow is... Um, due to be released, he's called into the warden's office and informed that his wife has died in a car crash. And he's released that very day, and he gets on an airplane to head home to Eagle Point. Um, as the plane took off, he fell asleep. Shadow was in a dark place, and the thing staring at him wore a buffalo's head, rank and furry with huge wet eyes. 
its body was a man's body, oiled and slick. Changes are coming, said the buffalo, without moving its lips. There are certain decisions that will have to be made. Firelight flickered from wet cave walls. Where am I? Shadow asked. In the earth and under the earth, said the buffalo man. You are where the forgotten wait. His eyes were liquid black marbles, and his voice was a rumble from beneath the world. He smelled like wet cow. Believe, he said, said the rumbling voice. If you are to survive, you must believe. Believe what? asked Shadow. What should I believe? He stared at Shadow, the buffalo man, and he drew himself up huge, and his eyes filled with fire. He opened his spit-flecked buffalo mouth, and it was red inside in the flames that burned inside him under the earth. Everything, roared the buffalo man. So this is uh, some of the recurring dreams that Shadow will have throughout the entire story of this buffalo man who we learn later is representative of the land or the creator, the original, the 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 god of everything, basically. The god of gods and men and, and everything. Um, and we also introduce the idea of belief here, Matt which is a pretty important theme that runs throughout this, this book. The idea that um, belief is the currency of the gods and it is something rather interesting for humans as well. And I think one of the, the most fascinating things to me, especially on the second read through was what I think Gaiman is saying about belief. And I don't think it's very positive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm glad you picked out the, the appearance of the Buffalo headed God, because I still feel, even after reading it, that I'm not sure what is going on metaphysically. And I think this is one of those cases where I'm reading the book wrong because I don't think I'm supposed to be thinking as hard about this. But like, I, I by the end of the book, you feel like you understand the dynamics of how the, all the gods feed off of belief, and and you know they're strong in proportion to basically how many people believe in and worship them. Um, but no one really knows about this god so how is it I, I don't really understand its function and again i'm i'm sort of rhetorically asking because i don't know if the book actually cares to answer that question um, yeah i mean i think it's just the the thing above the things that we normally think of as gods and i think the one thing that i like that this book does is there's an assumption when you're talking about america and you're talking about gods um, there's an assumption you make that you're like, oh, you see a Buffalo man. This must be the gods of the native people of this land. You know, like these are the, the original people that the set, this people came and settled this. And, uh, the, but the book even says that these gods are prior to them. Like there's a, there's a coming to America section when the, the native Americans come to America for the first time. So this Buffalo God the land itself predates all these things mm -hmm. and yeah. i kind of i kind of like i think gaiman is toying with your expectations a little bit there because i i think that was my original reaction it's like you, you you connect buffalo to native americans you connect to to spiritual gods and and stuff like that and he's kind of leading you there and it ends up not being quite true yeah yeah i i agree that that was a that that may even be where some of my confusion lies that that i i thought this was just for probably most of the book, actually, I was like, "Oh, this must be the oldest god, the the god of the of the Native Americans," and it yeah. turns out not really. No. Yeah, and I mean, I think the, the idea of the land, like we we wanna we wanna kind of personify and label these things, and I think I think the reason why you're having trouble with it is is maybe because of that very fact that maybe this has to just be this is just the nebulous thing the land the we we talk about the power of the land we talk about um we'll get into specific powerful places and all that but this is something that predates labeling and classifying it's just it's just existence almost yeah and it doesn't require belief and it doesn't require worship exactly yeah, yeah. Um, all right so from here uh, we, we're going to skip ahead a little bit here. This is one of those sections where I, I didn't want to skip things, but I felt I had to because on a plane, Shadow meets Wednesday, who, of course, we learn later is the god Odin. Um, he offers him a job, which Shadow originally declines and then accepts later um, once he runs into Mad Sweeney, a, a leprechaun, and then also learns that the guy who is going to offer him a job, Robbie, uh, is also dead. He died in the car with Laura. 
and they were having an affair. So he decides to to join them. Uh, Shadow gets a coin from Mad Sweeney in a fight and then drops the coin in Laura's grave, which brings her back from the dead, Matt. Uh-huh. Um, or, or She's at least undead. And they have a nice, awkward conversation. And she promises to watch over Shadow from the shadows, protecting her puppy. And then they head to Chicago to meet some friends of Wednesdays. And that's where we're going to pick up our analysis. In the days that were to come, Shadow often found himself remembering that game. Some nights he dreamed of it. His flat, round pieces were the color of old, dirty wood, nominally white. Chernobogs were dull, faded black. Shadow was first to move. In his dreams, there was no conversation as they played, just the loud click as the pieces were put down, or the hiss of wood against wood as they were, as they were slid from square to adjoining square. square. For the first half dozen moves, each of the men slipped pieces out onto the board into the center, leaving the black back row untouched. There were pauses between the moves, long, chess-like pauses, while each man watched and thought. Shadow had played checkers in prison. It passed time. He had played chess, too, but he was not temperamentally suited to chess. He did not like planning ahead. He preferred picking the move for the moment. You could win checkers like that sometimes. There was a click as Chernobog placed picked up a black piece and jumped it over one of Shadow's white pieces, placing it on the square on the other side. The old man picked up Shadow's white piece and put it on the table to the side of the board. First blood, you have lost, said Chernobog. The game is done. No, Shadow said Shadow. Game's got a long way to go yet. So here's the the checkers match, and I think there's a lot to talk about here, Matt. Um, first, I'm going to let you talk about your thing, because I know this is something that really bothered you on your first reading. <laughs> Yes. So, so, so this is, this is the deal is he, he says, if, you know, if, if you beat me at, at uh, checkers, then you get a chance to bash my head in with your hammer. Um, and if I win, then I guess, uh, then I guess Chernobog has to come with them on their mission. Um, I forget the details. There, there's like, there's like a second round of the, of the bet or whatever, but the consequence of the game is shadow loses and Chernobog says, "All right, you know, um, I get to bash your head in, um, <laughs> but but later." So for the whole for the whole book, the first time I was reading it, I was like anxious, and and like, when are we gonna resolve the thing where Chernobog is gonna bash his head in? Is, is this how this book is gonna end? And like, I couldn't enjoy the book. That's not true. I enjoyed the book less because I was, I was like, basically, it was like a pall over the whole book. It was like a tonal. You know, it's like if Winnie the Pooh began and it was and Christopher Robin was like, all right, Pooh, at the end of this book, I'm going to rip all your stuffing out and kill you. And then um, it's like, OK, well, why why do I need to be worried about the, for this for the whole book, especially when, you know, it doesn't it, it, it pays off in a way that on the second reread, you're like, yeah, that was nice. That was that was good. But. See, and that's and like I, I know I'm being weird about this, and I know probably no no one else in the world like perceive it this way, but I do think it's an interesting example of how you probably need to be careful with the uh, setups that you set up because people can become really preoccupied with ones that you didn't intend for them to latch onto necessarily. Anybody else feel this way about this? element of the story i have so many questions for you and one of them is why did you use winnie the pooh in that example um i i get what you're saying here it did not bother me as much i kind of just i think the book makes it very clear it's like we're going to resolve this at the end this is something that's resolved at the end and i I think what what it does to me is show kind of how little shadow values his life um he's willing to do this and just willing to go into do this like without really even thinking about it for no real reason um it's just he's like he's doing this i I mean the real thing is he's doing this because he feels like wednesday would want him to do this and that's kind of what shadow does he when he does act when he is not passive he acts because he feels like that's what someone would want him to do that's what laura would want him to do that's what wednesday would want him to do that's what his mom would want him to do that's kind of what shadow does and that's what he does here yeah and see that's another thing is that I, I actually read it as like, oh, he's suicidal, um, which I don't think he actually is suicidal, even though he does. No. He makes a lot of choices that are basically choosing death over and over in the story. So I maybe he is suicidal. 
I don't think he's suicidal. I think he's just indifferent to life. That's true, because he isn't. Because as Laura says, he isn't really really alive. Yeah. So um, Sergey says they also disliked it. Sammy says that they kind of did what you did. Um, and then at the end of the book, they said, oh, now it's time for Shadow to die. Yeah. Oh, we have and someone new here. Um, some some Dargans um, who I guess just wandered in not knowing <laughs> what we were doing. Um, it's refreshing. Yeah. We're doing, um, yeah, we're in a- analyzing the book, talking about themes and stuff like that. It's like a book club. We're talking. Um, Kangarang says that it was always looming around in the back, um, but it didn't bother them so much uh, as an anticlimax. I mean, I, I agree that the, the way it ended didn't bother me. It was exactly the looming in the back that was that was uh disturbing um prof says that chernabog not killing him was foreshadowed didn't feel like um he was doomed and i mean i think i think you're probably exactly right and i was probably like missing missing things uh um but i'm gratified to see that more than one person was also bothered by this yeah so let's talk let's talk about the game a little bit here because this is one of the things um, this is, I, I think choosing checkers here is very specific and I, I'm fascinated by that specificity because you could very easily just do a chess match here, but wh- why, why not do chess? Why would we do checkers? Which most people see as much less um, fascinating, like much less complicated, complex game, good game. Like a lot of people think checkers is boring and dull, and I think that reflects shadow. I mean, like th- this line here, um, he did not like he was not temperamentally suited to chess. He did not like planning ahead. He preferred to pick the perfect move for the moment. You could win in checkers like that sometimes. That's shadow. He doesn't plan ahead. He doesn't strategize. He just kind of comes to a fork in the road and decides at that time. And I, I think it's a fascinating exploration of checkers and I think it's it's also kind of reflecting on America too. We we have we have to we have to frame this whole thing in that this book is an exploration of our country and I think America likes chess or checkers over chess. Yeah, that's interesting. I like that. Yeah. I I was I was wondering what 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 your explanation was going to be because I couldn't think of any real reason why you would go with I mean it's a simpler game. It's uh easier to describe, you know, yeah. you don't have to talk about bishops and and pinning and whatever. So, um, yeah, yeah. I like that explanation a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, it, it's really cool. I, I, Chernabog is a fascinating character to me. Um, and his like change we see as he goes through, uh, the, there's a very like subtle background changes as he's literally changing into his, um, other self. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I, I like, Chernabog a lot um, because he's basically like an evil demon god <laughs> when you think about it. Like yeah. he 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 goes on these rants about how like back in the day they used to just like give him so many skulls that they would you know they just sacrifice people to him all the time. Most of the other gods we encounter don't get nearly that much human sacrifice uh, thrown their way, and he's so kind of blase and and entitled about it that it makes it almost endearing yeah um, like it's, it's weird how much you like chernabog despite the fact that he's horribly evil basically yeah um it, i mean he's like it's he, absolutely because he is the dark side of i'm i'm so bad at pronouncing these names but Baalbog is the, the 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 white side like it's the white god and the black god i mean that's literally what it is it's the light side and the the dark side um so he is kind of i mean he 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 is duality but the the version of him we see is the the back the bad one yeah yeah right yeah Sergei says that the checkers is also a metaphor for gods being in the end absolutely interchangeable they all will be what people believe them to be that's very true i like that a lot yeah, yeah. Because there's not checkers is a game without a uh, differentiation in pieces. The, every yeah. piece does the same thing. Yeah, there's no king certainly. Yeah. All right. Um, so next slide. Um, I feel so. So in this scene, um, Shadow wakes up at midnight and sees the third sister. Um, who's living with Chernabog, uh, Zoria, Zoria Polunochnaya, 
Polonochnaya awaits. I gave in... you this slide yes. specifically, so you would have to say it. Zoria Polonochnaya, uh, heading to the roof. There she gives him the moon, a, a silver Liberty Dollar coin that will protect him. Um, let's talk about the Zoria sisters now. I feel, Shadow told her, like I'm in a world with its own sense of logic, its own rules. Like when you're in a dream and you know there are rules you mustn't break, but you don't know what they are or what they mean. I have no idea what we're talking about or what happened today or pretty much anything since I got out of jail. I'm just going along with it, you know? I know, she said. She held his hand with a hand that was icy cold. You were given protection once, but you lost it already. You gave it away. You had the sun in your hand, and that is life itself. All I can give you is a much weaker protection. The daughter, not the father. But all helps, yes? Her white hair blew back around her face in the chilly wind, and Shadow knew that it was time to go back inside. Do I have to fight you or play checkers? he asked. You do not even have to kiss me, she told him. Just take the moon. How? Take the moon. I don't understand. Watch, said Zorio Pol Polonochnaya. She raised her left hand and held it in the front of the moon so that her forefinger and thumb seemed to be grasping it. Then in one smooth movement, she plucked it. For a moment, it looked like she had taken the moon from the sky, but then Shadow saw the moon shone still, and Zorio Polonochnaya opened her hand to display a silver liberty head dollar resting between finger and thumb. That was beautifully done, said Shadow. I didn't see you palm it. And I didn't know how you did that last bit. I did not palm it, she said. I took it, and now I give it to you to keep safe. Here, don't give this one away. So this is really a really big part of the book, and this is really important. Um, we have uh, we have the, the, the theme of and the image of coins throughout the story. The one thing that Shadow does to pass time is do coin tricks, and he's given two very specific coins. The first um, is the... Uh, gold coin that he's given from mad sweeney which literally represents life it's the it's sun it's life uh the the silver moon coin he gets is is representative of death but also of liberty they say that specifically later in the book that it it the coin having the coin liberated him several times as it's a, a liberty coin um and i wanted to talk to you matt about this idea of the coins and the coin tricks and, and how this is something so central to shadow and what you thought about that, that device that kind of carries us through the story. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because I hadn't really thought about it, but I think that there, there's a lot to be said about the way magic tricks work and the way, uh, the gods work in this story, because the reason why magic, the reason why coin tricks work is that your eye follows where you believe the coin is. Um, if, if you believe that they passed it between hands, then your eyes follow it and you're shocked and you think it's magic when the coin isn't where you expect and when it shows up where you don't expect. So in, in this sense, it's your it's your belief. It's an implicit belief, but it's a belief that makes coin tricks work. Right. Um, and, and the manipulation of that belief. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, um, I, I completely agree. And the the thing that I think is really cool about this is is what we're kind of doing with this is we're priming the reader to link Shadow with uh with Odin. Um Odin who does grifts constantly, which is just a larger version of the coin tricks that Shadow is doing. Um and, and you could argue like he finds this this coin tricks book in prison. Um he is given the coins by Loki. Um, so like a, a lot of what shadow does is being primed by other gods and, and their manipulation of him. And he kind of falls right into it. Um, I like, I like, like there is this idea and there's a, a, a section of this book that says it. I didn't pull it, but shadow is talking about how he's bad at stories. He's not good at stories because stories require the kind of manipulation that he can't do, but coin tricks are simple and quick and he, he's not good at telling stories, but he's good at doing this. And I think that's very important to like what the book is talking about. The importance of story is mentioned in this book several times. We have uh, Mr. Nancy, uh, the, the African god, who like his whole thing is he's the teller of stories. Um, and the, the, the stories that are told to these people manipulate them and move them through this whole thing. And he feels like he's not a person that is a good storyteller. And of course that pays off because in the end, the way he wins is by telling everyone a story and 
I, I like that idea a lot. It starts with these simple coin tricks as he kind of doesn't believe he's um, vibrant and alive enough to to construct story. And so he just does these little tricks instead. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. I, I don't think I tracked that element of him um, not thinking he was good at stories. But yeah, that that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we have our, our Zoria sisters here. Um, two of these sisters are actual real, uh, I say real, they are, were mythological Slavic gods, um, for the, the dawn and the, and, um, sunset, but Gaiman invented a third one, um, for the story. So the, the, this one here, uh, Polichnaya is the midnight goddess. Um, that was not real. Okay. Interesting. How yeah. dare he? I know, I know. It's a mess with all these gods. So there's something else before we move on I wanted to talk about briefly here, and, and there was no other place to put it, so it feels right. While Shadow and Wednesday are here, they sit down to a meal cooked by the Zoria sisters. Um, it's a homemade meal. It's like an old country food, and Shadow thinks the food is terrible. <laughs> it's, it's tasteless, it's bland, it's bad. And then at the end of the meal for dessert... He pulls out, they pull out uh, a store-bought apple pie, uh, an extremely American thing bought at a store. And the, the apple pie is described as absolutely delicious. He um, he was not satisfied by dinner, but the good old American store-bought apple pie is something that satisfies him. And again, I think that's that's something very specific that we're doing throughout the story is the idea of... Uh, American fast food as a reflection of American temperament. Like every time people eat in this book, it is burgers. It is fast food. They do this again and again and again. Um, the, we, when we go to the, the center of the United States, they have to drive 50 miles to get fast food burgers because just because that's what they want. And I think this is a very targeted kind of examination of America. Like these old foods, these old things that we've brought over, that's bland. That's boring. Um, let's get store-bought apple pie. That's delicious. The deliciousness of cheap, um, food that is not made with any kind of tradition or love to it. Yeah. I think that's one of the many, uh, kind of indications that these are very Americanized gods. I mean, they're, they have the attributes of their origin, but like Wednesday has no accent. Wednesday is American, right? I mean, right. And some of the other gods do have accents from their from their countries of origin, but they they are assimilating into America. And, and, and yeah, so they do things like eat store bought apple pie because they're they're as we'll find out by the end of the story. These aren't the original gods. These are the American versions of, of right. them. Um, That's the weird thing is it's not even immigration almost. It's like this Wednesday has never been has never left America. He mm -hmm. is he is the American Odin. That's yeah. who he is. These are the American versions of the gods. The gods did not come over with them. They were created here based on the the beliefs of the immigrants that came over. Um, and I think that is very a very interesting exploration of what it means to be an American. And we have to remember here that Neil Gaiman is an immigrant. He uh, was not born here. And he came over here and he experienced this world and he's writing about it in this book and he's writing about what he sees. And we talked about this at the end of last month's podcast. But the thing that I think is fascinating here is sometimes it takes someone um, external to your place to come in and examine it to really open up what your country is and what it means. And I, I think that's the brilliance of this book to me. Yeah, we're not going to talk about uh, the prologue or the epilogue, I don't think, uh, or, or the the postscript, I should say, but but uh, Gaiman does offer a lot of thoughts on his role as an observer, like someone who's lived here for a long time, but he still feels like a bit of an outsider. And, and, and yeah, it, it's cool to see someone's insights, what seems most salient to them about America as being American. It's kind of like, you know, asking a fish how the water is. It just seems normal. Right. And there's a slide we're going to get to later that I think expertly defines what does it mean to be American? And we'll see how kind of ridiculous of a term that is. Like the, the country is so big that the places are so different from each other that the, the, the things that hold us together as American are very broad and in specific. It's just like, it's fascinating to me. Yeah, I agree. All right. 
So the next slide is the story of Essie Tregoen. Um, basically, we don't have like the, the coming to America um, end of chapter little codas are probably some of my favorite parts of the book, but I just think they're it's because they're expertly well written and not because um, there's too much to examine there. I think it's it, it, so we're not going to do all of them. I think I, I pulled this the end of this one out just as like a chance for us to talk about these codas as a whole. So we'll read this one and then we'll talk about it. Okay. Essie Tregoen, said the stranger. The widow Richardson looked up, shading her eyes in the May sunshine. Do I know you? she asked. She had not heard him approach. The man was dressed all in green, dusty green trues, green jacket, and a dark green coat. His hair was a carroty red, and he grinned at her all lopsided. There was something about the man that made her happy to look at him, and something else that whispered of danger. You might say that you know me, he said. He squinted down at her, and she squinted right back up at him, searching his moon face for a clue to his identity. He looked as young as one of her old grandchildren, yet he called her by her old name, and there was a burr in his voice, and she knew she knew from her childhood, from the rocks and the moors of home. You're a Cornishman? she asked. That I am, a cousin Jack, said the red-haired man, or rather, that I was, but now I'm here in this new world where nobody puts out a pale... A, a pail of milk for an honest fellow or a loaf of bread come harvest time. The woman studied the bowl of peas on her lap. If you are who I think you are, she asked, said, then I have no quarrel with you. In the house she could hear Filda grumbling to the housekeeper. Nor I with you, said the red-haired fellow, a little sadly. Although it was you that brought me here, you and a few like you into this land with no time for magic and no pl place for pixies and such folk. You've done me many a good turn, she said. Good and ill, said the squinting stranger. We're like the wind. We blows both ways. Essie nodded. So yeah, this is the end of Essie's story as he takes her away, presumably to the land of the dead. I, I, so I wanted to talk about these these codas with you, Matt, because I, I find them really fascinating. And one of the, the things I noticed this time really was how each of these coming to America things, almost all of them, the people that we're talking about that came to America did not come by choice. Like Essie in this case was sentenced to transportation, which is something to define the book where instead of uh, being put to death or rotting in prison, they just say, okay, you have to go live in America. Sucks for you. Um, we have uh, slaves come over a little bit later. We have the, the, the native Americans that cross the land bridge. Um, yeah. I guess they're not technically native Americans. The, the, the first men that cross the land bridge are kind of ordered by the God that they believe into. So all these people have come to this country. Um, even, even the, the salesmen, yeah. Um, that he is kind of forced by his brother-in-law. Like the, the people that come here didn't want to come here and they brought things with them that like, so, so you have these people that don't want to be here, bringing thing, things with them, gods with them, um, old ways with them that, that don't work here. And I, I find that idea fascinating that America was created by people forced here. Yeah. Um, I, I agree that I didn't notice that uh, the thing the thing that I was noticing about each of the of the different coming to America stories was that um, excuse me um, the, the the basically very different things happen to sort of generate or or punctuate something about the mythology by the end of each one so like with the with the group that became the Native Americans, they all got wiped out, which kind of implies that their god is now extinct. Um, with, uh, I think it's Salim, the salesman, I think that's his name. Like, yeah. the the god who he meets sort of vanishes, and then he kind of takes his place, and you're almost, you're almost like, did, did he become the god now? Um, I, I wasn't clear on that, but I thought that was... That was an interesting twist. In this one, the woman just directly meets the god, uh, you know, in in the flesh, in a way that I don't think happens in any any of the other interludes. Uh, in the case with the slaves, they also don't um, they don't really meet the gods in the same way as as this woman does in this interlude. It's more like they're able to use their kind of ancestral twin magic in various ways. And but but that's I think because their religion is substantially different, and yeah. and so they're they're practicing their their religion more than they're necessarily interfacing with the gods. I just that's I thought it was really interesting how in in each one, um, it's taking the this idea of what the gods are and and how they actually operate very 
in very different directions. Yeah, I think you're right. That that's that uh, that's not something I had considered. But you know, thinking about the 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 slave woman, she has to kind of witness the death of her god because she's training, she's teaching all these things to her uh, the next person in line, and she doesn't care about the the stuff behind it she cares about the functionality why does this work how does this work the, the almost the science of the ritual she's not interested with the meaning and the theme of the ritual which i think is a, a very kind of incisive like american critique um yeah yeah what, what can we get out of this what, what can we exactly. use it for yeah and the thing about this is like i i don't think like gaiman dislikes america he obviously immigrated here he this is this is his home now but he's not afraid to look directly into the, the eyes of the, the cultural differences between this place and the rest of the world. And I, I, I don't want us to come off like, it's like, we're, yeah, let's dig on America. Cause I don't, I don't think that's what it's doing. I think it's just having a Frank um, outside observation of what, what this, this land is. Yeah. It, it's a, I mean, they say it so many times in the book, it's a land that's not good for gods. Yeah. And, um, and you could also make the the pragmatic case of like in, in that story you were just referring to, why should the witch's apprentice care? You know, yeah. it, it's it's not she's no longer part of a of a traditional culture, and and she's you know such such stories and such beliefs mean something when they're embedded in an ancient culture, uh, and everyone around you believes and knows about the same things. They don't really mean the same thing when you just cross the ocean and you're the only person who knows about it. It doesn't. It doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't mean any. It doesn't mean the same thing, even if it, even if it does something for you. Yeah, and I mean their meaning is subject to the whims of people who change what they believe all the time, um, for what's convenient and what's not. You know. So yeah. Um, I I like this like, this this one and like they're talking about no one else has time to put out the stuff for them now. Um, but also he says, you know, she's, she's been worshiping this God for her entire life. She always made sure to put out the thing. And, and he states here, like, she's like, you've done good for me. Like you protected me. You did good for me. And he's like, yeah, good, good and bad, good and ill. Um, we're, we're like the wind. So like, why worship these gods that don't like, that do bad to you sometimes too, just because they blow with the wind. It's yeah. like, it's like a very pragmatic look at that says, why am I going to do stuff for you? Believe in you, put faith in you. If you just do whatever you feel like. Yeah. That, that also seems to be a recurring element across, yeah across a lot of these, like pretty much every one of them actually, like the, the one that jumps to my mind now is actually the Norsemen who, who land, you know, somewhere in, in North America or, or Greenland, perhaps yeah. I, I guess, I guess it has to be North America for it to be American gods, but they, they basically, they, they sacrifice a native American to Odin. They see the sign that he's accepted it of the two Ravens landing on the body. And then they're all horribly murdered. So <laughs> uh, Odin, it, it's like by the, you know, by, by the time you get into this book, you realize that Odin is such a prick that he might've, had them all killed on purpose um, or that he just couldn't protect them or that he didn't care to. Um, it seems yeah. like a, in a lot of cases, the gods are real. They, they, they hear the prayers as it were, but they don't, they don't particularly do much uh, about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of even intentionally unclear what power they have to do stuff about it. Like most of the, the specific power we see of the gods is pretty limited like they can't do whatever they want. They mostly the most of their powers are internally focused. It's like stuff they can do to make their lives easier, how they can manipulate people, confuse people. Like we see Shadow at the end of this book use powers to like change someone's mind. But that's only one of the very few specific examples of them doing like things. Yeah, I think Hinzelman is the only god who actually exerts a lot of power, but we'll yeah. get there. Yeah, we we will. We will. Okay, so next, having recruited Chernabog and stolen some money from the local bank through a rather inventive con uh, that people in real life have actually tried, and it worked until they were caught, apparently. Yeah, yeah people read this book, tried the <laughs> bank con, it worked, and then they went to jail because they got caught. Yeah, don't they say in this book that a bank robbery always works for, well, anyway. Yeah. 
Um, so Shadow and Wednesday head to the House on the Rock um, uh, for the meeting between the gods. So what is this place? Asked Shadow as I walked through the parking lot towards the low, unimpressive wooden building. This is a roadside attraction, said Wednesday. One of the finest, which means it is a place of power. Come again? It's perfectly simple, said Wednesday. In other countries, over the years, people recognize the places of power. Sometimes it would be a natural formation. Sometimes it would just be a place that was somehow special. They knew that something important was happening there, that there was some focusing point, some channel, some window to the eminent. And so they would build temples or cathedrals or erect stone circles or, well, you get the idea. There are churches all across the states, though, said Shadow. In every town, sometimes on every block, and about as significant in this context as a dentist's office. No, in the USA, people still get the call, or some of them, and they feel themselves being called to from the transcendent, vo transcendent void, and they respond to it by building a motel out of beer bottles, or somewhere uh, of somewhere they've never visited, or by, uh, sorry, a model of beer bottles out of somewhere they've never visited, or by erecting a gigantic bat house in some part of the country that bats have traditionally declined to visit. Roadside attractions. People feel themselves being pulled to places where, in other parts of the world, they would recognize that part of themselves that is truly transcendent and buy a hot dog and walk around, feeling satisfied on a level beneath that. You have some pretty whacked out theories, said Shadow. Nothing theoretical about it, young man, said Wednesday. You should have figured that out by now. So roadside attractions, uh, Matt, road trips. These yeah. are things that are quintessentially American. Um, we, our infrastructure really developed right around the time the car was coming out. So America, more than other any other country, I think, drives and drives long distance. It's, it's the kind of a combination of a huge country of re America really adopting the car faster than just about anywhere else. And we love road trips. And as a result of that, roadside attractions are a thing. And this book uses this idea. Like, I can imagine Neil Gaiman, like, driving around America and seeing, like, the ball of yarn and these ridiculous nonsense things that exist and, and, and trying to grasp his head around what would possess a person to do this? Yeah. And why would people want to go see it? And of course, he, he slots this into his mythology, this idea that this is this is a powerful place that in the past people would build a place of worship around. And to America, a place of worship is look at this cool thing I made. Yeah, it's just an excuse to go there. Um, I, I I agree. It's, it is it is fun to to imagine him sort of staring in befuddlement at this phenomenon and, and thinking what what is it about these people that makes them do this? Because I don't know. I've, I mean, I've, I've traveled obviously, but I've never seen what I would call a roadside attraction. Like you, you go to, you know, you, you go to most countries and they have like an actual history. So if you're going to see something, it's like, Oh yeah, there's a 700 year old church or something. Yeah. There's a, there's a church older than people have than you know, Europeans have been in, in North America. Um, but, and I think maybe that's kind of, I mean, we're, this is diverging from talking to the book a bit, but I would say, I would say that the, the, it, it, to the extent that Americans don't have like ancient um, monuments, we still have to populate the landscape with things that have some meaning. So we make them up uh, much yeah. like we uh, kind of have our McDonald's version of all these gods. We have our McDonald's version of ancient holy places. And yeah. I think that's, re that's a really fun idea. Yeah, and we should say that the House on the Rock is a real place. This is, I think he, he exaggerated it a bit, but this is a real roadside attraction. This is a real thing. The story of the guy who made, who built this ridiculous house and people wanted to come see it, so he started charging for it. That's all true. That happened. Um, and I think it's cool that he, he, he mixes in the real with this stuff. Yeah, he says in, I believe it's the foreword that, that most of these things, most of these places in the book are real. Yeah. So that's cool. Yeah. And this, of course, I, I think is the perfect idea of why the old gods don't work here. Like why, why a, an ancient mythology cannot work in a place like this when we build 
monuments to yarn and beer bottle models. Um, it's just like the, the, the disconnect between this place, this specific place of worship and kind of the Americanized version of that place of worship. Yeah. Yeah. So now it's time to ride the carousel, the world's okay. largest carousel, Matt. One moment, Shadow was riding the world's largest carousel, holding on to his eagle-headed tiger, and then the red and white lights of the carousel stretched and shivered and went out, and he was falling through an ocean of stars while the mechanical waltz was replaced by a pounding rhythmic roll and crash, as of cymbals or the breakers on the shores of a far ocean. The only light was starlight, but illuminated everything with a cold clarity. Beneath him his mount stretched and padded, its warm fur under his left hand, its feathers beneath his right. It's a good ride, isn't it? The voice came from behind him, in its ears, in its ears and in his mind. Shadow turned slowly, st st streaming images of himself as he moved, frozen moments each him, each him captured in a fraction of a second, every tiny movement lasting for an infinite period. The imagery that reached his mind made no sense. It was like seeing the world through the multifaceted jewels, uh, jeweled eyes of the dragonfly. But each facet he saw something completely different, and he was unable to combine the things he was seeing, or thought he was seeing, into a whole that made any sense. He was looking at Mr. Nancy, an old black man with a pencil mustache, in his check sports jacket and his lemon yellow gloves, riding a carousel lion as it rose and lowered high in the air. And at the same time, in the same place, he saw a jeweled spider as high as a horse, its eyes an emerald nebula, strutting, staring down at him. And simultaneously, he was looking at an extraordinarily tall man with teak-colored skin and three sets of arms, wearing a flowing ostrich feather headdress, his face painted with red stripes, riding an irritated golden lion, two of his six hands holding tightly to the beast's mane. And he was also seeing a young black boy, dressed in rags, his left foot all swollen and crawling with black flies. And last of all, and beneath all of these things, Shadow was looking at a tiny brown spider, hiding under a withered ochre leaf. Is that how you pronounce that? Sure. I say it ochre. Ochre. That's probably right. Shadow saw all of these things, and he knew they were the same things. Um, yeah, some Dargan says, I love the imagery of the scene. It really cements that there's more to this world. Yeah, absolutely. This is, I guess, the reveal. Um, I think probably most of the people reading the book had kind of picked up on a lot of this by now, but... For Shadow, this is the reveal that these people are gods, and I I really, really like this writing here. I love the quadality <laughs> of <laughs> of and how it's described, how you're seeing these these different things at the same time, and, and almost like the inherent contradiction is like how can they be how can he be five, four, five, six different things at the same time? Well, and I think the 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 contradiction of this kind of stuff is is one of the things this book really talks about. So, um, the contradiction of belief is something we're going to get into a little bit later. But here we see a thing can be multiple things at the same time is what the book is telling us. Yeah, and I think it's it's illustrated fantastically. Because there's a temptation to say, okay, yeah, but which one of these is is the real fundamental, uh, you know, Mister Nancy, and and like you said, I, I don't think that's that's where this book is is playing. It's saying, yeah, they're they're all, they're all Mr. Nancy. Th this is the essence of him. The essence of him is that there have been different versions of him over time, and he kind of coalesces out of that, and he's all of these things. Yeah, and that's a fun idea. Yeah, um, that that is that is great. And I think I think what it gets down to is here: how, how can how can one person be five things at the same time? And the answer is, well, if you believe in all of them, then that then they are. And then yeah. I think that's fascinating. And I, I love yeah. this so much. This this is this really is our transition mark. We've seen we've seen the the weird stuff. Uh, some Dargans mentions the Bilqua scene that we didn't talk about, but that's very earlier in the book where she eats a man with her vagina. Um, we've seen this otherworldly stuff before, but we've never really explicitly seen it from Shadow's point of view. And that's kind of we've crossed the sh threshold at this point. I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's. I mean, that's definitely what this scene is. Is is we 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 know we're in a magical world. Weirdly, Shadow seems to be in denial about it. That's why I think on the last slide, um, Mr. Wednesday was like, "You really should have figured this out by now." Right. Because um, he's seen weird things. He he's continues to be in denial about it. Um, what's funny is, on the second read through, it 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 seemed more implausible that he was, um, 
not catching on. Uh, but yeah, by the time we get to this scene, this is the it, it's undeniable now. He sees this. Um, actually, I don't remember. He he may still be like, "What was that all about?" And then still try to play it off after this happens. Is, is that true? He, I think he's much more accepting of what's going on, but he's still like he knows it's true, but he has trouble believing it still. Yeah. And that's of course the that's the whole thing is is belief, and he that's yeah. the part he has trouble with. Yeah, I think the headspace that he's in the whole time is sort of like he 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 keeps thinking things like he already knew he had he had sort of always known but but it 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 came to his consciousness finally so it's like on some level he always knows this is how the world is um but uh because he i mean he is like a demigod basically so yeah yeah, it would make sense Mm -hmm. um yeah so moving on uh, after the house on the rock, the gods and Shadow all go to dinner, but before Shadow can get into the restaurant, uh, an American diner, he's kidnapped by Mr. Wood and Mr. Road, uh, sorry, Mr. Uh, Wood and Mr. Stone, two uh, nebulous government agents working for Mr. World. They lock him in a train car moving west and are trying to get information from him related to Wednesday's plan, but before they hurt him too much, Laura shows up and brutally murders every single person there. <laughs> Uh, Shadow escapes and hides out with Mr. Ibis and Mr. Jackal in Cairo, Illinois. Um, They are undertakers and also Egyptian gods. Uh, Then Shadow has sex with a cat. This book is is great. Um, (laughs) Yeah, and then we move to... uh, We had to skip all that, unfortunately. There's a lot of good stuff in there, but we got to move this thing along. Yeah. Um, So... They walked outside the restaurant. Shadow found it hard to believe how much colder it had gotten in the last few hours. It felt too cold to snow now. Aggressively cold. This was a bad winter. Hey, Wednesday. Most of the scams you were telling me about. The violin scam and the bishop one. The bishop and the cop. He hesitated, trying to form his thoughts to bring it into focus. What of them? Then he had it. They're both two-man scams. One guy on each side. Did you used to have a partner? Shadow's breath came in clouds. He promised himself that when he got to Lakeside, he would spend some of his Christmas bonus on on the warmest, thickest winter coat that money could buy. Yes, said Wednesday. Yes, I had a partner, a junior partner. But, alas, those days are gone. Shadow experienced a dizzying moment of double vision. He saw the grizzled man facing him, squeezing his shoulder, but he saw something else. So many winters, hundreds and hundreds of winters, and a gray man in a broad-brimmed hat, walking from settlement to settlement, leaning on his staff, staring in through the windows in the firelight, at a joy and a burning life he would never be able to touch, never be able to feel. So I pulled this out because one, where basically Gaiman does this thing that I think he's really good at in his stories, which is basically telling you everything you need to know right in front of your face. You just like miss it. Like, I mean, this is such in retrospect such an obvious move here like this is the a big hint that's staring you right in the face it's like it's it's all a two-man grift guys that's yeah. what it is and and i love i love how like shadow is struggling to put the pieces together here like he he hesitated trying to form his thought to bring it into focus then he had it they're both two-man scams and that's just like shadow is often described as people as as kind of slow um and that's because of moments like this where he he like he takes time to work through things and process things. And I wonder if part of that slowness is just the gods are fucking with him and like trying to get him not to make these mental connections. Um, so he's always kind of playing catch up. I, yeah. I, I don't know if there's anything to actually support that, but yeah, maybe so. Um, I think this is one of the only moments in the story that makes uh, Wednesday seem anything other than like a mean bastard uh, because he he was brought to America, you know, like you like you mentioned earlier, essentially unwillingly, and then for hundreds of years just wanders around miserably, alone, isolated, rejected, um, not belonging here. This isn't a place for him. This isn't this isn't his world, uh, and, and he kind of knows he's never going to be on top the way he was back in the old days, and you kind of feel for him in this scene. I don't, I can't recall in any other time that that makes you actually kind of care about him because most of the time he's being gruff and 
at, like at best he'll be a bit like patronizingly fatherly, which is, yeah. which is still not that great. Um, but at least this, this makes you see him as a bit of a pitiful figure. Yeah, you're right. And I think that's, that's kind of why I wanted to pull out this part because there is something there as, as asshole and terrible as a lot of these gods are, there's something tragic to this way of life. It is, it is a uniquely terrible existence. You are not human. You are forced to live amongst the humans. People that have forgotten you have moved on. You, you rely on their belief to sustain yourself, which is something that is fickle and ever changing. And this idea of, um, staring in through the windows at the firelight at a joy and a burning life he would never be able to touch. These people, like, the, the gods act like humans a lot, and they have, um, I mean, they have jobs, They, but but it's not, it's it's a it's a sad existence. Um, one of the things that I really noticed is how many gods, specifically the old gods, have labor, um, like kind of like low-income earning type jobs, right? It, it is... It is a hard, difficult, miserable kind of life that they they are forced to live. Yeah, yeah, that, that's they're basically all living the lives of of, of immigrants, exactly, you know, of yeah. first generation immigrants who don't have any real support system. Um, you know, I, I remember the toward the end when when he goes to Mister Nancy's house and it's it's just kind of a. Like it's it's like he's he's tried to make it homey, but it's not like the abode of a god. It's like a he sleeps on the couch, you know. It's not it's not too impressive. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're they're just they're just getting by, and that's you know the book is trying to sell you on this idea that even the the old most you know powerful gods are are just getting by here. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So then. Wednesday heads to Lakeside, and we're going to be there for a while. And he meets Hinzelman, uh, an old man that lives in the town. So we'll go around the lake. Grand tour, said Hinzelman. Main Street, which they were on, was a pretty street, even at night, and it looked old-fashioned in the best sense of the word, as if, for hundreds of years, people had been caring for that street, and they had not been in a hurry to lose anything they liked. Hinzelman pointed out the town's two restaurants as they passed them, a German restaurant and what he described as Greek, Norwegian, but of everything and a popover at every plate. Bit of everything and a popover at every plate. He pointed out the bakery and the bookstore. When I say, what I say is, a town isn't a town without a bookstore. It may call itself a town, but unless it's got a bookstore, it knows it's not fooling a soul. He slowed Tessie as they passed the library so Shadow could get a good look at it. Antique gaslights flickered over the doorway, Hinselman proudly calling Shadow's attention to them. Built in the 1870s by John Heading, Local number baron. He wanted to call it the Henning Memorial Library, but when he died, they started calling it the Lakeside Library, and I guess it'll be the Lakeside Library now until the end of time. Isn't it a dream? He couldn't have been prouder of it if he had built it himself. The building reminded Shadow of a castle, and he said so. That's right, agreed Hinselman. Turrets and all. Henning wanted it to look like that on the outside. Inside, they still have all the original pine shelving. Miriam Schultz wants to tear the insides out and modernize, but it's on the register of historical places, and there's not a damn thing she can do. They drove around the south side of the lake. The town circled the lake, which was a 30-foot drop below the level of the road. Shadow could see the patches of white ice dulling the surface of the lake, with, here and there, a shiny patch of water reflecting the lights of the town. So this is Lakeside. And once again, we have Gaiman giving us very clear um, wordplay here to basically never lie to us. And, and, and it's right in front of us. Like the, the truth is right in front of us here. Um, th this idea of as if for hundreds of years people had been caring for that street and they had not been in a hurry to lose anything they liked. That's that's Hinzelman. Um, he loved it as if he built it himself. Obviously that, that he he did. Um, I, like it's right in plain sight here, and I think Gaiman really enjoys toying with the readers that way. Yeah, he, he's. It seems like he's even kept it like homogeneous to the sort of ethnic group that that he would have associated with. Um, you know where he came from, I guess. Yeah. Um, it, it's yeah, it's funny because when I was re-reading this, uh, I, w I was like, man, how did I not immediately get that this guy is supposed to be a god? Because <laughs> he's 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 like an outlandish character. He has this force of personality. He has this ability to tear to tell stories that reminds you uh, of a Nancy. And um, he, he, I think it's just like he's so likable that you don't want to think about 
the direction that this is all going to go in. But yeah. uh, the, I think this, I think he might be my favorite character, um, and, and one of, one of the more interesting things that he's doing with this book, in, in my opinion. I think I suspect different different people have different favorites, but um, I like I like this part. I I love Lakeside, and part of my disappointment in the book is I wish more of the book was Lakeside because th- this is Lakeside is this fascinating examination of you know the the standard typical what everyone thinks of when they think of small town America, right? That's Lakeside. And we have this person ruling over it and doing these terrible things to help it survive. And we'll, we'll get there in a bit, but I think you're right that Hinzelman doesn't stand out because there's just so, so something so quaint and typical about this town that it feels normal. It doesn't feel um, like it doesn't feel like anything else in the book. And But at the same time, there is like there is a little bit of just too perfect. Like there's this recurring beat throughout the the book where they say Lakeside is a good town. Yeah. And and they kind of hint at the kids that go missing. And and it's it's fascinating what we're doing with this, this idea of people's perfect image of small town America and what the book is saying about what it takes to create that yeah that, that that's true it's um it, there's definitely the theme we talked plenty already about the theme of belief being yeah. critical to the gods but what we haven't talked about much is the theme of sacrifice being what really feeds them like they they subsist on belief but if people are willing to sacrifice to them that's when they actually become powerful yeah and and that's of course you know very consistent and and you know probably the, the one of the points in the in the book where he's the most consistent in terms of how the magic system if you will works is that Henselman gets this huge amount of sacrifices and thus he's more powerful than the other gods and he you know we, we don't quite realize i don't think that we're supposed to be asking why is it that shadow can hide in this town but the reason yeah. he can is because of Henselman um and yeah it's the, the the sacrifice thing obviously comes into play much more later on, but at this point in the story, we're less primed for it. Yeah, and I mean, Lakeside is a really important part of the book, and that's kind of why I was bummed that the the resolution um, is done in the epilogue. We, we move to the quote-unquote epilogue of the book, even though it's like 40 pages long. It's a long epilogue, but yeah. that's where we, we resolve the Lakeside stuff. And yeah. I, I wanted that to be the main thrust of the story because I think Lakeside is this place where Shadow starts to reinvent himself as well. Uh, he he assumes this new identity that we're about to talk about and starts to discover who he is and but by assuming a different identity. And I, and I find that part fascinating. It's like the beginning of of Shadow's growth. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's cool how, how he... <laughs> he becomes fond of Mike Ainsel and is like trying it on like a, like, like a skin and and is just really enjoying it. So, so yeah, shadow assumes the identity of of Mike Ainsel. Uh, It's an, it's an identity completely different from shadow and one that, that where, where he appears to be a happy person. Um, Ainsel, by the way, means my own self. Yeah. Um, So this, I mean, pretty thinly veiled metaphor here um, for shadow discovering himself by assuming this, this identity. Yeah. So what do you do, Mr. Ainsel? Asked the chief of police. Big guy like you, what's your profession? And will you be practicing it in Lakeside? Shadow's heart began to pound, but his voice was steady. I work for my uncle. He buys and sells stuff all over the country. I just do the heavy lifting. Does he pay well? I'm family. He knows I'm not going to rip him off, and I'm learning a little about the trade on the way until I figure out what it is I really want to do. It was coming out of him with conviction, smooth as, as a snake. He knew everything about big Mike Ainsel in that moment, and he liked Mike Ainsel. Mike Ainsel had none of the problems that Shadow had. Ainsel had never been married. Mike Ainsel had never been interrogated on a freight train by Mr. Wood and Mr. Stone. Televisions did not speak to Mr. Ainsel. You want to you see Lucy's tits? Asked the voice in his head. Mike Ainsel didn't have bad dreams or believe there was a storm coming. Yeah, so... Uh, first of all, I think this is fantastically written. The the repetition of Ainsel here, I think, is really effective. And I, I love that this is... he's Mike Ainsel is an escape from the problems that Shadow has, but 
we have to remember what Ainsel means, my own self. Um, I think the the section of this book is called like I Ainsel, which again <laughs> is um, <laughs> yeah. And, and as some some Dargans points out here that shadow claimed earlier in the book that he was not good at stories and here he constructs the story and this isn't the first time he's done this by the way during the con the the bank con he had to construct a story around a character the security guard character and he was fantastic in that it just kind of flowed out of him just like it does here so i think we're seeing shadow kind of maybe understand his strengths um that that were possibly always there he just didn't believe them i think that's exactly right i think he never tried before he didn't he didn't know what he was capable of yeah you do have to I, I do wonder if if he had these powers before he met wednesday i suspect he did he's just, he just wasn't aware of it yeah i mean i think probably like according to the very loose rules of this, this story um I think you would have to say yes. He just was yeah. not aware of it, did not channel it, did not know how to use it, never tried because he was content in his life to just be in the background and follow people around. And Yeah. Uh, and his wife mentions the time when she would walk into rooms and not realize he was there, which yeah. kind of reminds you of the fact that he, at the end of the book, basically becomes invisible. Yeah, he does. So, he absolutely does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sir Grau in the Discord chat says that the late side stuff reminds him of Hot Fuzz, the, the, which is, I mean that's that's very true. It's like this 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 extreme desire to keep this perfect thing that's that's feeding him, and it's they're, the, what they're willing to do to keep that going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the late side stuff really is the most emotionally compelling and has the most consequence because yeah I, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves and I, I'm not sure if you pulled this quote or not but there's a part of the book where it basically says regarding the big war of the gods like none of this is really happening of <laughs> I did not pull that but yeah which which is very like deflating at the time because you're like I'm trying to enjoy the drama here you didn't need to remind me that this is fiction but yeah but yeah, yeah like you this this guy's been murdering a child every year. So, like in terms of what you actually can empathize with and care about, my heart is is and always was much closer to the lakeside stuff than to the abstract magical gods. Yeah, fake, and I think a conflict. I think abstract is the perfect word there because, and I think that's why the drama kind of disappears because it's almost too abstract. You lose you lose the thread a little bit and. I think it, it, it tries really hard, like the the confrontation between Loki and Laura, we're jumping way ahead, but that confrontation um, tries to be still like character level, but the 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 conflict surrounding it and, and the stakes behind it are so big and, and, and nebulous too. Like here here's the thing. What would so let's say Loki won. Loki and, and Odin won, right? All the gods killed themselves and they got super powerful. What would they have done? Yeah. Like what, what was going to happen to the world? Was it, was the world like, were, were they going to start making like, was it, it going to go back to the times of, of death by sacrifice and chaos and, and ruin all across the country or, or not? Like, I don't, I don't believe that the story constructs a world in which even if they had succeeded, that this would have been a long-term solution to their problem because America is not a place for gods. Like that's something yeah. like, even if you do this long con and maybe that's part of it, maybe that's, that's showing how short-sighted and selfish Odin is that even if he succeeds in this thing, it's not going to solve his problem. It's not going to fix anything. It's just a temp. It's a, just a temporary relief. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure about, about that. Um, well, we, we're we'll get we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I will have stuff to say when we get there. Yeah. So, some Dargan says not living a life of conning in America. I guess. And yeah, that's true. He probably would not have to live basically on the streets conning people out of meals and and ten bucks. Um, yeah. But so so like I guess what I what I wanted to say is there's a level on which this is all fake. It's 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 all actually happening in the hearts and minds of the American people. Is right, is kind right. of the idea. So. So 
so that's a very complicated, very abstract thing then, because what you're what what the book is saying is, um, people think that they're that that they're struggling, they're having some inner struggle or perhaps a struggle, uh, you know, a, a cultural struggle about um, do we worship the new technology, uh, the future, or do we worship the old, um, maybe the old gods, maybe just the idea of, of um, you know, their, their heritage and, um, and, and wisdom. Um, but, but actually what's then going to happen is everyone changes their minds and realizes that Odin, god of the ravens, is the one true god that they should worship. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think, I think you're absolutely right that that the 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 main metaphor behind this is is old versus new. Remove the gods. It's move on to the next best thing, or remember your past and your history and the, where you came from. And I think, I guess we're we're jumping ahead. I think that where where the book settles on that is both and neither, kind of. Yeah, yeah. But we'll get to that in a sec. Okay. Um, so now I think this is, this is, what slide are we on? I'm, I'm we lost. Are on, Did I we skip are, one? We're on, oh, no. Oh, no. you're going to be on 13. Abort. Abort. <laughs> you're on 13. Ah, yes. This is San Francisco. San Francisco in January was unseasonably warm, warm enough that sweat prickled on the back of Shadow's neck. Wednesday was wearing a deep blue suit and a pair of gold rimmed spectacles that made him look like an entertainment lawyer. Now it was late in the afternoon. Shadow, who had not been in San Francisco since he was a boy, who had only seen it since then as a background to movies, was astonished at how familiar it was, how colorful and unique the wooden houses, how steep the hills, how very much it didn't feel like anywhere else. It's almost hard to believe that this is the same country as Lakeside, he said. Wednesday glared at him. Then he said, It's not. San Francisco isn't in the same country as Lakeside any more than New Orleans is in the same country as New York, or Miami is in the same country as Minneapolis. Is that so? said Shadow mildly. Indeed it is. They may share certain cultural signifiers, money, a federal government, entertainment. It's the same land, obviously. But only things that give the illusion of being one country are the Greenback, The Tonight Show, and McDonald's. So this is kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, that um, America as a concrete block thing is only held together by these kind of cultural things and a few structural things right um but america as a whole is so many different things it's so, like and and so many different people and people that live completely different lives that don't touch each other or impact each other or understand each other at all and that and i think that's something that that's I mean, we, we see that it's not something that's completely unique to America, but it is very different from the way things were prior to America. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of prior to America, he, he mentions the land uh, explicitly, like right. almost almost dismissively. It's the same land, obviously, but like we <laughs> we understand that kind of underneath everything that's happening the land is is making moves I, I wonder if wednesday is even aware of the fact that the land is speaking to shadow you know um, yeah i don't i don't think so because i think that's one of the reasons why shadow wins mm -hmm. because there's that whole time when he dreams about the thunderbirds and wednesday is like furious at him yeah um i don't i don't think i don't think the land i i think to wednesday a, a power above that of gods is something he probably doesn't have a lot of time for yeah i don't think he is even aware of it we don't see any indication that he is yeah yeah i think this is one of those things that gaiman inserts here and he even emphasizes it like i love that it's italicized it's italicized because wednesday says the land but it's also italicized to bring to bring our attention to it yeah yeah um all right so moving on uh, Laura comes to Lakeside where, uh, where he's holding up, uh, having been called to see Shadow, but not by him. They talk about Shadow and about their relationship. Um, yeah, so here we go. It must be hard, said Laura, not being alive. You mean it's hard for you to be dead? Look, I'm still going to figure out how to bring you back properly. I think I'm on the right track. 
No, she said. I mean, I'm grateful, and I hope you really can do it. I did a lot of bad stuff. She shook her head. But I was talking about you. I'm alive, said Shadow. I'm not dead, remember? You're not dead, she said. But I'm not sure that you're alive either. Not really. This isn't the way this conversation goes, thought Shadow. This isn't the way anything goes. I love you, she said dispassionately. You're my puppy, but when you're really dead, you get to see things clearer. It's like there isn't anyone there. You know, you're this big, solid, man-shaped hole in the world. She frowned. Even when we were together, I loved being with you because you adored me. You would do anything for me. But sometimes I'd go into a room, and I wouldn't think there was anybody there. And I'd turn the light on, or I'd turn the light off, and I'd realize you were in there, sitting on your own, not reading, not watching TV, not doing anything. They were approaching the rest area, where he had parked his car. Shadow felt the need to say something. I love you, or please don't go, or I'm sorry. The kind of words you used to patch a conversation that had lurched without warning into the dark places. Instead, he said, I'm not dead. Maybe not, she said. But you, are you sure you aren't alive? Are, are you sure you're alive? Burn, uh, Laura. Yeah, that's, that's harsh. Yeah. It's almost like she's dead and can't really moderate her <laughs> statements. Yeah, um, I wanted to use this as an excuse to talk about Laura and Shadow and mm -hmm. their relationship. But one of the things that I think this book does really well is is kind of not deliberately point out their relationship, but we learn more and more about them. We learn that the reason why Shadow went to prison is because Laura basically made him do this bank robbery. Um, was it a bank robbery? See, I get confused yeah. with the TV show. I think in the TV show it was a casino thing, but I think yeah. it was a bank robbery in the book. It was a bank robbery, which is mentioned all of like twice as far as I can yeah. tell. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really offhand mentioned that it, and he didn't even go to jail for the bank robbery. He went to jail because the two people he did it with, he was just the driver, stiffed him on the money. So he went and beat the shit out of him. And this is all because of Laura. She put him up to this. She pushed him to this. And this changed his life. And against we have to go back to the puppy thing, like this idea that, I mean, it seems here that Laura never really even loved Shadow. Um, like, she even says here, I loved being with you because you adored me. Like, I didn't love you for you. I loved you because you loved me. You would do anything for me. I loved the attention. I loved the loyalty. I didn't love you. Um, and, and I think that's emphasized here. Like, I love you, she said dispassionately. Like, yeah. like you're my puppy. And so maybe she did love him, but she loved him like you love a dog. And that's not like that's not a relationship. That's not marriage. Um and and she kind of puts it all on him here that that you were not there, you were not like you were sitting in a dark room doing nothing. And I I don't like Shadow kind of takes this to heart and takes this personally and, and ends up making choices later to prove that this is not true. Um, but I don't, what do you, I mean, does the book support this view that Laura has of shadow? See, that's the thing is it throughout the time we know him, he, he does sort of go with the flow very often, but he'll also, like I mentioned way toward the beginning, he'll like pick fights with people. Um, he'll, he'll, he'll start arguments He'll he'll make strange moves like like offering to play the checkers game with Chernobog, which no one prompted him to do, um, which which was like bold and and risky, and so, like on one level he is risky and, and heroic, and certainly by the end of the story he is. But even before he's made any kind of character change, he's you know he's he's very like defensive of of um, is it Sam when he meets her you know yeah. like like he's just kind of a a stand-up guy so i don't i, I it, like honestly I, like l the character the character of laura just seems like a terrible person um yes and, and and i'm a bit confused as to whether the book is trying to make us um feel sympathetic for her because there's nothing to feel like i don't see any reason to you know like she's sh sh shadow likes her and you have protagonist bias which as we have learned here at the daily planet is a very powerful force <laughs> so so we're biased in favor of kind of liking her and forgiving her because shadow does but she's 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 awful like like she doesn't do anything redeeming except i guess i guess in the end she she 
sacrifices herself for him. So that's something, I guess. Yeah, I mean, she. It's 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 interesting because she um. She she does help him throughout the book. I mean, she murdered, as Sammy says in chat, she murdered a bunch of guys for him. She did that. True. That's absolutely true. But what was the purpose? Why did she do that? Why did she feel like she had to protect him? What was it out of guilt? Was it because of the mystical whammy that brought her back to life, like links him with her? And this is something I think actually the show does a better job of of exploring that that he the book kind of casually talks about he is this beacon for her that she's just kind of drawn to. Um but yeah, I mean, she's definitely not a good person. And I think, I think you're kind of confused as he, like, he talks about how much he misses her and how much he loved her. And like, you never see it. You never see it. Any of this, even here. I mean, like, like she's here and the dead person says to shadow, it must be hard not being alive. And it's just like, what are you doing? Like even we, I, I, I didn't get to it, but in this scene, she talks about how like, Oh, well, like, at least when I was cheating on you with your boss and best friend, like, he was there and conscious and he liked to look himself in the mirror as we had sex. And it's like, f- fuck you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Are you sure you're not saying that in a calculated way meant to break the right. guy's heart? Yeah. It's just and, and, and the, the excuse that she's undead and therefore has no filter is a good one. But I don't know, man. I I, I think you're you're like escaping Laura to me is a very important part of him. And I think that's, I mean, that's why he liked it's That's verbally. He says why he liked Mike Ansel so much was that he was never married. He didn't have to deal with Laura and this thing. And yeah. this is, I think the, the book, the book points out that Laura's appearance here is like the first crack in the persona of Mike Ansel, which throughout the, the next few, few chapters after this basically is, is discovered and disappears and he loses that idea. And, and, her presence here is the first little chip in that of, of this, this persona away from her. And Mm -hmm. one one thing I'll say about the difference between reading this book the first time and listening to it on the audio book is that I, and I'm only now realizing now that I'm thinking about this particular issue is that I felt like when I read it, I felt like this was the dramatic, the dramatic flow of the story was this. Shadow is excited about leaving prison, finds out that his wife is dead, is completely shattered, is is so shattered that he can't even grieve. He just like stumbles back to his his cell and is just like dead inside, basically. And the and then my interpretation was the reason why he's kind of um first of all could be interpreted as suicidal and just generally affectless and somewhat affectless for most of the book is because he's he's hasn't processed his grief and is refusing to process his grief because it's too painful um on the second read through i just didn't it it actually just seemed like he her her death is kind of nagging at him in the back of his mind but it's not as big a deal as I felt like it was the first time I read it. And I think that's yeah. because with, with the benefit of hindsight, he seems to, he seems to come, he, he seems to find peace with it pretty fluidly over the course of the story. Yeah. I mean, yes and no, like his, his side goal the entire time is to find a way to bring her back to life. That's true. Um, yeah. And it, it, I mean, it is interesting because the inciting incident of the story is Laura's death. That's what gets this this ball rolling. And so I think I, I don't think you're at fault for feeling like the dramatic weight of the story hinged around Shadow and Laura. And I think it does in the in the effect of escaping Laura and stop like not being puppy, not being Shadow, being who he is, is shadows movement through the story that is how he succeeds in the end um so i guess that is like tangentially related to like his relationship with laura but but yeah it is not specific it is not specifically about shadow and laura yeah yeah i I take your point that once she comes back in an undead form he's no longer really grieving in the same way because he thinks he might be able to save her but But he is grieving their relationship, sort of, sure, because yeah. she cheated on him and seems pretty blasé about it. And he, he doesn't ever seem to think about that when she's not around. 
um, in yeah. a very like flinching away from and, and just refusing to think about it way. So yeah, yeah. Freaking Laura. I, I will say one thing the show does very well is kind of paint the character Laura with a much finer brush. Okay. Um, she is a much more fleshed out character with wants and needs. I actually like what the the show does with with Laura a lot. I like it a okay. lot. Yeah, I might check that out. I yeah, I mean, I, I we were gonna try to talk about the show at the end of this. We're going long, so we're not gonna do that. But I think the show is the changes it makes are interesting and good, and, and for the most part, I really liked it. Um, yeah, it's okay. It's um, visually fantastic too, which is cool. good because this is a book that should be visually fantastic. Yeah. All right. So um, after this, we have everyone suddenly seems to be coming to Lakeside. Um, Shadow gave a ride to a young woman named Sam earlier in the book, and suddenly she's here. She's the the, the sister of his next door neighbor. And then Audrey, his uh, his friend's wife, shows up too, and it's it's like almost like people are being drawn here to to ferret out Shadow or something. Um, but while he is having a conversation with Sam, she kind of outlines her belief. And as you guys can see, this is a very long paragraph. I'm not going to read it because I timed myself reading it and it took like two minutes to read it. And I'm not going to do that. But I wanted to still pull it because th the essence of this paragraph is Sam is a person who believes in everything like the start off here shadow says it's not easy to believe um because that's the thing he's struggling through most of the story and her answer is i can believe anything like look look at all these things i can believe look at all these contradictory things i can believe um i can believe that things are true and things that aren't true and things where nobody knows if they're true or not um later on she says i can believe in a woman's right to choose a baby's right to live and that while all human life is sacred there's nothing wrong with the death penalty if you can trust the legal system implicitly and that no one but a moron would ever trust the legal system these are like exclude like mutually exclusive beliefs that contradict each other but it doesn't matter because the importance is the belief not if the belief makes sense and i think that's the fundamental core theme of belief is is shown here in Sam. I think out of any moment in the story, Sam's uh, speech here feels the most like Gaiman talking to the reader. Um, because if you think about like structurally and logically, where did this stuff come from? Like, like I don't think any human being would just <laughs> be able to spout off something like this, right? Like, there, there's no way Sam had this all on deck, just ready to go. So right. this, this feels almost the most story breaking moment. And, and we're having a, a thematic conversation about belief. And the conclusion here is that people can believe in whatever they want. And it doesn't matter the contradictory evidence to the thing they believe in. They can also believe in that too, because people are illogical creatures that just, if something, if they like something, they'll, they'll believe in it. And, I think that's that's why and and I think you can distill this down to maybe like Americans like we're talking about American gods maybe that that's one of the things he's noticing about Americans that our our ability to accept something and and, and earnestly believe into it is is I don't want to say unique because that like makes us special and I don't think we're special but um, different. Yeah, it, I, this character definitely felt like he was literally drawing like a stereotype of this kind of person um and trying to be kind about it too because you could with a lot of these kind of stereotypes of a certain kind of american that he draws in this book you could make it very mean and pointed sure yeah um, but sam is very likable and, and and there's almost like a dignity and, and a um a nobility somehow to the fact that she's able to boldly say that she believes two contradictory things because like you said, the the point isn't consistency for her. It's it's more about just opening herself to all the possibilities, I, I suppose. Yeah. Well, and we, when we get to the, the center of everything later in the book, um, they specifically say the importance is not the fact behind it. It's the belief. Like the, the center of the the monument to the center of the United States is not in the center of the United States, but it doesn't matter because that's where people believe it is. And and that's that's the, the kind of the fickle almost illogical nature of belief mm -hmm. yeah so so yeah let's go ahead and move on to 
um, the center of everything. Um, so yeah, so so yeah, so Wednesday meets with the new gods to parlay, but he's tricked, and while being broadcast to all the gods, old and new, on the TV, Wednesday is shot in the head and killed. Any old gods that were on the fence about taking up arms against the new ones are spurred by this to take up the cause. Shadow and Nancy and Chernabog agree to meet the new gods at truly neutral ground to collect Wednesday's body. Determining the exact center of anything can be problematic at best. With living things, people for example, or continents, the problem becomes one of intangibles. What is the center of a man? What is the center of a dream? And in the case of the continental United States, one sh should one count Alaska when one, uh, when one att attempts to find the center, or Hawaii? As the, tw as the 20th century began, they made a huge model of the USA. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The lower 48 states out of cardboard, and to find the center, they balanced it on a pin until they found the single place it balanced. Near as anyone could figure out, the exact center of the continental United States was several miles from Lebanon in Smith County, Kansas, on Johnny Gribbs' hog farm. By the 1930s, the people of Lebanon were all ready to put a, a monument up in the middle of the hog farm, but Johnny Gribbs said that he didn't want millions of tourists coming in and trampling all over and upsetting the hogs, and the locals figured he had a point. So they put the monument to the geographical center of the United States, two miles north of the town. They built a park and a stone monument to put in the park and put a brass plaque to go on the monument to tell you that you were indeed looking at the exact geographical center of the United States of America. They blacked off the road from the town to the little park and certain of the influx of tourists just waiting to come to, to Lebanon, they even built a motel by the monument. They brought in a little mobile chapel as well and took off the wheels. Then they waited for the tourists and the holiday makers to come all the people who wanted to tell the world they'd been to the center of America and marveled and prayed. The tourists did not come. Nobody came. So I, I want to pick your brain about this because this is something I'm not sure I've settled on an interpretation of because we have earlier in the book, we talked about the power of, of places and how we built roadside attractions to the powerful moments and, and the powerful places on in the land in America. This is a place that they describe as the exact opposite of of powerful, of spiritual, of holy. The, like it's unpowerful. Like it, it's it's nothing. It's it's a place where there is no belief, no power, nothing. And I I, I wonder what we're trying to say about this that there is almost a the closest I've gotten to it is is there is almost this like cold calculated nature of how they found this place and declared it important like first of all it's not even in really in the center of of america S second of all why does the exact center of america matter like what what is like they built this thing that's supposed to be this big important thing but it is not a place of power it is in fact the exact opposite because who cares about the center yeah it, it doesn't mean anything it doesn't represent anything other than the geography, which is the least important aspect um, of, you know, the the country. Right. Um, there's also the element that like America is not is not a good land for gods. And if you're if you're if you're taking the essence of that, if you're finding the center of the place, it's not a good place for gods. Then the, you're the taking most, like, yeah. the, the most unholy place. <laughs> um, there's another thing on this slide. I don't know. If I can make any, if I can connect it to what you were you were saying, but they mentioned, you know, it's several miles from Lebanon, uh, in Smith County, Kansas. That's a funny, a funny sentence there. Lebanon, Smith County, Kansas, because like he's almost making fun of the fact that that place names in the United States mix together, like different languages in different parts of the world because everything is taken from somewhere else. And there's that whole part of the book where they they travel, you know, to, to Cairo yeah. and there, there's several different cities that have the names of, of old, um, of, of ancient cities in other parts of the world. And it's, it's just like this pastiche of, of ripping off the old world, but, but almost, um, without any actual meaning, like they explicitly mention that 
th three different people, I believe, have three different stories for why uh, a certain place has the name that it has. Yeah, yeah, K Cairo. And I, I think you're absolutely right here. And that's, I think that is something he's doing here. I, I didn't think about Lebanon. It's so funny. I don't, I don't think about that as, as foreign, but you're absolutely right. It, I love, we didn't talk about Cairo very much, but I love this idea. It's first of all, that they are, that you, you, this is the name of a city. It is spelled like a real city on the planet and you are pronouncing it wrong. Why are you pronouncing it wrong? Cause it's, it's America and this is how it's yeah. pronounced in America. And there's right. a, there's a Thebes city too in, in, in Southern Illinois. Um, yeah. And it, it, I love the idea of taking the name without the meaning. And that is something that we see over and over again in this book. We've just kind of plastered these old world things on everything. And, but the meaning behind it has been lost. It, it, it is, it, it only means what it means to America. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything else to humanity as a whole. Yeah, and and I do wonder if like the reason why he juxtaposed the re the reason why he inserts this mention of the fact that it's near Lebanon specifically is to say, you know, this this placing the center of America doesn't mean anything. Just like calling that city Lebanon doesn't mean anything. It's right. just a label. Right, and I mean, I think the 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 hog farm imagery is is specific to that as well. It's like hog farms our uh, pigs are, are kind of dirty animals. They roll in, in mud, they live in mud. And that's, that's showing this, this place that they've declared one of the most important places in the United States that they thought millions of people were going to come is actually just sitting in the middle of a guy's hog farm. And he doesn't yeah. want people there. It's like, cause you're going to upset the hogs. It's just so unimportant. So nonsensical. Yeah, and also aren't hog farms like the most disgusting place that no one would ever want to visit anyway? So yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, mean I, I, what's funny is this is probably all true. Yeah, I didn't. This is one of the ones that I didn't look up, but I would okay. not be surprised at all. Yeah, well, it's it's so meaningful if, if if it's whether whether or not it's true. Right. Okay. I wonder if any other country in the world has tried to find the geographical center of it. I like. I don't. I mean, perhaps I don't see like France going, Oh, where's the center of France? Yeah. That's interesting because Americans like in our hearts believe that the United States has had the same borders for a hundred thousand years. Yeah. Even though we know that's not true. Whereas I feel like the European countries, their, their history tends to be so long that perhaps there's more of an awareness that their country's borders are kind of shifting semi continuously. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Also, there's there's a, actually a line that I think supports that earlier in the book where they I think Wednesday says um, the United States is the only country that wonders what it is like that, that that's like ponders what it is and why it is. The rest mm -hmm. of the country is just like, well, we're just we're, we're here. Yeah. Is... Yeah. Or, or they have a strong sense of identity like, oh, yeah, we are we are we are French. Right. Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, it's a great accent, man. Thank you. All right. All right. So, so they've they've gotten the body back, um, and Shadow decides to hold the vigil for Wednesday. Tell me about the vigil," said Shadow. "Someone has to stay with the body. It's a tradition. One of our people would do it. He wanted me to do it. No," said Chernabog. "It will kill you. Bad, bad, bad idea. Yeah, it'll kill me to stay with his body." Nancy said. The person on the vigil gets tied to the tree, just like Wednesday was, and then they hang there for nine days and nine nights. No food, no water, all alone. At the end, they cut the person down, and if they live, well, it could happen. And Wednesday will have had his vigil. Chernabog said, maybe Alvis will send up one of his people. A dwarf could survive it. I'll do it, said Shadow. No, said Mr. Nancy. Yes, said Shadow. The two old men were silent. Then Nancy said, why? Because it's the kind of thing a living person would do, said Shadow. You are crazy, said Chernabog. Maybe, but I'm going to hold Wednesday's vigil. So, because it is the kind of thing a living person would do, this is Laura's influence on Shadow. Um, and the, the ironic thing here, Matt, is Shadow is searching for his own sense of self, his own identity, his uh, Ainsel, and... Why does he do this? He does it because Wednesday wanted him to, and because Laura 
told him he wasn't really alive. So yeah. he is still being a shadow. He is still only doing things because it's expected of him. Yeah. He's, he's still he's getting, not there yet. Yeah, he's not. And and I think this is the trial. This is the challenge. This is the yeah. the slaying the dragon. Because because and that's what's interesting is it's very difficult to find the climax of this book. Do you agree? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because it could be almost, uh, you could say it's during the vigil. You could say that he's already essentially won. He, he's, he's attained what he needs to attain as a character before he even comes out of the vigil. And, and it's all just, you know, finishing the paperwork when he, when he goes to the site of the battle. Um, I think that's probably right. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds the best to me. We can, we can th maybe talk more about that as we get closer. Yeah, yeah. To that part. Um, um, so I, I, I want to use this to talk about the vigil a little bit here sure. because I, I, we didn't pull the slides because it, it was like, I wanted to pull something from him sitting on the tree, but there was like so much of it and it was so good. I just kind of gave up, but I think the writing of him actually tied, tied to the tree and the stuff he goes through is fantastic. I think there's just this wonderful bit of imagery, um, as to what he's going through, like how he kind of goes insane at times and, and different people are talking to him, different gods. Laura is talking to him. He, he assumes that the Laura talking to him is a dream. It turns out it's not. She was actually there. Um, I just think this is really wonderful writing, and I, and I loved it. I loved yeah. it so much. Jesus gives him some wine, some water, <laughs> <laughs> um, as in the form of a squirrel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so... So yeah, I, I I agree. I'm I I was wondering like how do you do research to determine what it would actually feel like to be tied to a tree for nine days? Yeah, I mean, did um, he just make that up, or did he actually like explain like, how how would your muscles hurt and in what order? Because it is very specific, like how the pain he goes through, um, yeah. and and how it shifts from uncomfortable to un like I love how he described like the pain moved beyond pain, like it just got so painful that like. You, it's indescribable how much it hurt yeah yeah I, I agree that was a that's that's one of the more um beautiful and striking parts of the book yeah yeah so yeah so while shadow is you know he he basically dies on the tree um for for some value of dead because these are god things we're talking about <laughs> while he's dead it is revealed that mr world is actually loki and he and wednesday are running a grift on everyone Loki has ordered Mr. Town, a uh, friend of wood, and stone to collect a, a branch from the world tree Shadow is taking Vigil on and to bring it with him, uh, to bring it uh, to, to, to Mr. World, a.k.a. Yeah. Loki. Uh, he will declare all the deaths during the war uh, as dedicated to Odin and both of the gods and the new uh, pan pantheon will feed, the, feed on the destruction. Sorry, I got that backwards. Both Odin and Loki will feed on the destruction and chaos as each side destroys each other. Town doesn't make it because he stops by the road to pick up Laura, who kills him and then stabs both herself and Loki with the stick, which turns into a spear. So. Um, yeah. Uh, and, before we move on, Prof in the chat points out that the, uh, the, the chipmunk on the tree branch is part of the, the world tree myth. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's cool. Ratatosker, yeah, is, ah. is north is a north myth, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Hangs out on the world tree, yeah. Okay, um, so this is, I believe this is part of the um, the the vigil vision, right? Yeah, the, I mean, this is I guess it's technically post vigil. It's it's he's dead. He's he's in he's journeying through the underworld. He's met Mister Jackal. He's met the Zoria sister again, and and given up his coin and taken the path of. Um, I think it was lies or truth and he takes the path of truth and finds out that he is Wednesday's son and then he runs into someone else and yeah. three more paths. Okay. He looked at the first path with the feeling of recognition. It opened into a vast chamber or a set of chambers like a dark museum. He knew it already. He had been there once, although for several moments he was unable to remember when or where. He could hear the long echoes of tiny noises. He could hear the noise that the dust makes as it settles. It was the place that he had dreamed of, that first night that Laura had come to him in the motel so long ago, the endless memorial hall to the gods that were forgotten and the ones whose very existence had been lost. He took a step backward. 
He walked to the path on the far side and looked ahead. There was a Disneyland quality, quality to the corridor, black plexiglass walls and lights set in them. The colored lights blinked and flashed in the illusion of order for no particular reason, like the console lights on a television starship. He could hear something there as well, a deep vibrating bass drone, which Shadow could feel in the pit of his stomach. He looked and he stopped and looked around. Neither way seemed right, not any longer. He was done with paths. The middle way, the way of the cat, the cat woman had told him to walk. That was his way. He moved toward it. So this is really interesting, and I want to try to parse this because so there are three ways, and we're specifically told that one way lies to wisdom, one way li- makes him whole, and one way he will be dead, like dead, dead, like real dead. Um, and and the book never explicitly tells us which is which. Um, it never links the paths he's looking at to which of those things. So it kind of leaves it up for you. And it never it never really explicitly says what the middle one is. The order it does it in is wisdom, whole, and death. So when she says choose the middle one, the assumption is he chooses the one that will make him whole. But we're never specifically told that. Especially because he sort of gets wisdom he sort of gets whole and he sort of gets death yeah and that i mean that is the most interesting thing to be like on the surface this is the choice between the old and the new right we have the hall that leads him down to the the where the gods have been forgotten these are the old old gods that have all been forgotten on the other side we have this plexiglass disneyland that's the future the new um they're both making sounds one is one is a deep vibrating bass drone. One is this this tiny uh, sound of silence almost. And he chooses neither, neither the old nor the new. He chooses his own path, the center path. Um, but the interesting, here's where I think, I think the, where the book falters for me. Because he chooses the middle path. He calls it the middle way, his way. But he did that because he asked someone to choose for him and she told him where to go and he did it. So he's still just doing what people tell him to do. And I, I like, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that was, that was what Gaiman was going for that here, even at the end, even at the moment of his choice, he's still kind of being shadowy. Yeah. I think even up to the very end, he still does what people want. Um, I think we're yeah. probably going to get to to the to the ending scenes pretty quickly, but um, it seems like I, I don't know. It, it is weird from a character growth, character arc point of view that that's and that's one reason why I say it's hard to point out the climax of the of the story <laughs> is that it's like well, I mean, it should be this, right? Yeah, I mean, like it's either this or it's the moment when he has his heart weighed and gets to choose what his afterlife is and and chooses nothingness. Yeah. <laughs> Which, which, yet again, he chooses that. You could say that's his own choice, but then when somebody comes to get him, he's like, "All right, fine." Yeah. He's, he's he's like grumpy about it briefly. That's yeah. that's 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 his agency. <laughs> I'm trying to remember um, when, uh, when Laura, when he takes the coin from Laura, is that because she asked him to, or is that kind of his choice? I think it's kind of because she asked him to. Yeah, I think um, you're right. She, yeah, she's she's ready. She's ready to be dead by that point. Yeah, and she hadn't been ready at that at, earlier. Um, there's something in the in the section we pulled out. We didn't focus on it, but when he says, "Don't worry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save you. Like I'm working on it. I've got a lead," and she's like, "Oh, that's good to hear. I've done so many bad things." So like in the back of her mind, there's this worry that if she's dead, dead, the, her moment of judgment will come. And she will be found lacking. So it's, it's something that's kind of like very casually just put out there and never really focused on. But that that happens. Yeah, that's very interesting. I don't think I read that into the fact that she says that there, but I think you're absolutely right. All right. So Shadow chooses nothingness. He, he passes all his tests. Um, he chooses not the new nor the old. But maybe maybe the answer is a little of both. And his re- he's rewarded by just getting to relax yeah for like five minutes this is it's his bath that he was looking forward to and then he's resurrected by easter the god easter who flies out here to help him he's he's resurrected and he figures out the con 
and he rushes back to the battle between the gods and gives his big speech. Yep. You know, said Shadow to the air in a conversational voice, this is not a war. This was never intended to be a war. And if any of you think this is a war, you're deluding yourselves. He heard grumbling noises from both sides. He had impressed nobody. We are fighting for our survival, lowed a minotaur from one side of the area. We are fighting for our existence, shouted a mouth in the pillar of glittering smoke from the other. This is a bad land for gods, said Shadow. As an opening statement, it wasn't friends Roman's countrymen, but it would do. You've probably learned that, in your own way. The old gods are ignored. The new gods are quickly taken up as they are abandoned, cast aside for the next big thing. Either you'll be forgotten, or you're scared you're going to be rendered obsolete. Or maybe you're just getting tired of existing on the whim of people. The grumbles were fewer now. He had said something they agreed with. Now, while they were listening, he had to tell them a story. There was a god who came here from a far land, and whose power and influence waned as belief in him faded. He was a god who took his power from sacrifice, and from death, and especially from war. He would have deaths of those who fell in war dedicated to him, whole battlefields which, in the, country, in the old country, gave him power and sustenance. Now he was old. He made a living as a grifter, working with other, another god from his pantheon, a god of chaos and deceit. Together they rooked the gullible. Together they took people for all they'd got. Somewhere in there, maybe fifty years ago, maybe a hundred, they put a plan in motion, a plan to create a reserve of power they could both tap into, something that would make them stronger than they had ever been. After all, what could be more powerful than a battlefield covered with dead gods? The game they played was called Let's You and Him Fight. Do you see? So this works. This is Shadow's moment. You could call this the climax too, I think, Matt. Um, yeah. Because this is his big speech. Um, he, Interestingly enough, <laughs> he is echoing the words of the land, right? Um, and they actually say that explicitly in the epilogue. He says, good job. You said our words to the people. Which, again, makes him <laughs> a person without agency. Yeah, he's getting blown around by yeah. greater forces and... Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's a great scene. Uh, it reminds me of another book that we talked about on, on this, this book club, uh, Good Omens, where the, the resolution of the book is, is this, it, it's basically happening on like a celestial sort of metaphorical plane of existence where yeah. it's simultaneously, it's simultaneously a huge thing with the, the fate of thousands of gods and, and all this power hanging on it. And it's also really just one guy like stepping forward to do what he needs to do. Yeah. And, and, and that's the level on which you connect to it emotionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's, he's come to this realization. He's chosen neither old nor new or something in between. And he, he shares that with everyone through the power of story, which once again, we go back to a shadow at the beginning of the book who said, I'm not good at story. All I can do is I, I would make a bad musician or a bad. He says, I would make a bad magician because I am not good at story. Uh, all I can do is these simple tricks. And he is great at story. He, he convinces gods to lay down their arms by telling them a tale. And it's, I, I it's a good scene. I think you're right that like, it's a lot of this frustrates me. And it's because like, it's intentionally designed to be this nebulous unknown thing that yeah. I just I, like, I, I don't need, I don't need the book to specifically tell me what it's about, but I just feel like I don't, I don't know what the, the, the sides of it are. The, the, the mistakes. Like, yeah. You have to paint, you have to like fill in the box a little bit and, and I don't need to know, see, need to see every little bit of it, but I need to see the borders. I need to, I need to know where I am kind of. And yeah. I, and it, you're you're right that that if he had made some steps toward connecting the con the outcome of this battle to something we would actually care about, like the only person who I would mind if they died in this battle pretty much was was uh, Anansi, because he's like the only god character who who I who I actually like that much. Yeah. Um. And, and then a lot of the god characters that we've met aren't even at the battle, so it's like okay, well. That sure doesn't matter. But like, what if, you know, what if you had some element in the story where the gods like had particular humans who were kind of enthralled to them and, 
and uh, and maybe we grow to like some of those characters, and then it's obvious that if their god dies, then they suffer or something. Like you, I, I realize I'm suggesting some pretty broad changes to how he would have done the story, but um, something to anchor it in stakes that you actually connect to beyond yeah yeah beyond what what happened here yeah and 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 i think the reason why this doesn't feel like a dramatic like the reason why the drama the drama doesn't fully land here i think is i don't think in my opinion this this is not the reveal of the conceit of the book because like like this is a bad land for gods is not something like we know like that's been told to us from the very beginning that this was a bad land for i think the reveal of the conceit of the story the main idea of the story what the story is saying is lakeside and i think that which is in the epilogue so i mean i think that's why the the dramatic moment here just doesn't land for me as much as i would want it to i can imagine shadow giving up and giving this speech the guy that doesn't talk very much speaking in front of all these people telling this story and it working is a great moment but i think you're right it just doesn't it does, you don't feel it yeah yeah i don't have much else to say i share i share your frustration like it, you're, you're kind of like you kind of nod with a mildly satisfied expression on your face when you read this part and then you're like, yeah, but it's kind of hoping it would be a little bit more impactful. So it's kind of like you said way at the beginning, like I think we both really like this book, but there are frustrations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's move into our, our final slide. All right. Well, so second yeah. to last, right? I think this is the last one. We didn't do 20 yet. Yeah, twenty is our, our last slide. Oh, it's the last one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I, I get it. All right, sorry. Yeah. So, so here we go. He is in Lakeside, and he's talking to Henselman, who has pulled him out of the uh, the lake after he went out on the ice to to try to pull open the trunk of the clunker, and I. <laughs> I definitely appreciated the it's in the trunk uh, dream more this time. It is. So, I mean, that's a funny little bit, right? Like it's, yeah. it's game and messing with you. Like he's talking to an elephant while sitting on a tree. He, I mean, the game is using every definition of trunk. Yeah. Yeah. There was a reason he hid me in lakeside. Wasn't there? There was a reason nobody should have been able to find me here. Hinselman said nothing. He unhooked a heavy black powder from his, from its place on the wall uh, sorry, poker from its place on the wall, and he prodded at the fire with it, sending up a cloud of orange sparks and smoke. This is my home, he said petulantly. It's a good town. Shadow finished his coffee. He put the cup down on the floor. The effort was exhausting. How long have you been here? Long enough. And you made the lake? Hinselman peered at him, surprised. Yes, he said. I made the lake. They were calling it a lake when I got here, but it weren't nothing more than a spring and a mill pond and a creek. He paused. I figured this country is hell on my kind of folk. It eats us. I didn't want to be eaten, so I made a deal. I gave them a lake, and I gave them prosperity. And all it cost them was one child every winter. Good kids, said Henselman, shaking his old head slowly. They were all good kids. I'd only picked the ones I liked. Except for Charlie Nelligan. He was a bad seed, that one. He was, what, 1924, 1925? Yeah, that was the deal. So this is the deep, dark secret of Lakeside, and therefore extended out the deep, dark secret of the country. <laughs> yeah. That this way of life, this um, American dream, we'll call it, this idealistic small-town American thing is is one on the backs of sacrificial children. And and it, there's there's a lot of ways where you can expand this metaphor out, Matt. I kind of went crazy with it and talked about how we tend to send our our kids to war to fight for us, to fight for our, to stay free and safe. Um, those are our children dying to keep us in the way we are comfortable, but also this idea of um the the America as itself being bought on the backs of the suffering of some of its 
uh, weakest people is, and I, and I don't think this is something that's exclusive to our country. I think this is a problem that happens all over the world, but this is, if, if Lakeside is this idealistic, wonderful, perfect image of what an American town is, then what does it take to get there? Like we said earlier, what does it take to accomplish this? What does it take to um, realize that it's death and and cruelty and violence yeah i mean that i agree with you that's what the book is saying i find that to be terribly um like negative and and not not entirely true either like the way you build a good community is through pro-social activity and taking care of each other and and giving to one another and and uh selflessness like it Yes, it, it happens to be true historically that America has made mistakes like every other country and, and we've there, there's there's been the sacrifice of innocence often for goals that weren't even worthy in the first place. Um, but I don't think that the reason towns are good is because of blood sacrifice. I mean, yeah, I, mean I, I, I'm not I don't know. I don't want to like argue with the book, but I'm just I'm, I'm kind of like, really, that's. Okay. Uh, well, let's. I think actually we can refocus this because I think okay. I think what this is more saying, this is the idealistic image of a town that doesn't exist in this country anymore. It's gone. It, like like in in modern day America, even modern day America, when this book was written back at the turn of the millennium, um, this idealistic no problem small town life doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. Like, like, like we said, the, the mining moved out, like our industry has shifted globalization. These, this thing has died, but so maybe it's less, this is what it keeps America good. But if you want to keep America in the old way, the way that you love and reject, like, cause remember there's that scene where Hinsman is talking about, they want to modernize the inside of the library. And he's like, no, I like, like it's a historical thing. Like Lakeside does not change. Lakeside does like there is no um, technological growth there. Um, They talk about how long it takes the phones to get connected. Um, Lakeside is this this out of time slice of America. So maybe it's more discussing this idea that you can't go back to the old ways. Um, We shouldn't just fully embrace the new ways either, but we should find this happy medium. And the only way the only way to keep the old ways around is through cruelty and terribleness to the weakest among the populace. I think that's that's a much more targeted metaphor that I can get behind. And Sammy says, yeah, if you want to make America great again. Yeah. I mean this was <laughs> this was 16 years before Trump, but yeah, I mean I mean I that's that's kind of what I see it as, this this desire to go back to the old ways and what does that cost us? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. It it's it, th- that you would actually have to literally brutalize the younger generation to to get them to to not grow to not develop and become right. the new which is frightening um and, and in that sense henselman is the the greatest representative of the old gods and their fear of change i also yeah. like henselman is just the character who i like i wish we we had more time to talk about him because he's definitely the most pitiful of the gods because he, he was basically like originally a child who was horribly mistreated like in an almost unimaginably horrible way and murdered and then that that, like that sacrifice actually made him into a god and then he comes to america and almost like an abuser like my mind kind of went there like the way the the abuser recapitulates what was done to them yeah exactly he he decides like he he's going to and that's another thing is like I don't think other people are are killing these kids. I think he's killing them um, himself and sacri- basically sacrificing them to himself because that was kind of how the tribe did it. And he's just this very sad, tragic character. He doesn't really seem to regret it. Unfortunately, like that would that would be a different. Uh, but I, I don't think these gods usually regret the things that they do. Like no. they just are. That that's just that, that's just their nature. No, I think. I don't think he regrets it at all. I think he thinks it's it was a a sacrifice worth making. Because Lake Town is a good it's a good town, Matt. It's yeah, a good right. town. 
And if that's the price we have to pay for a good, good old fashioned town, then that's the price we pay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sergey says that the way the book handled Jesus felt like a cop out. It felt like Gaiman just didn't come up with any good ideas and swept it under the rug. Um, did you read, did your version of the book have the chapter that he wrote about Jesus that he ended up taking out? I'm of, I'm of two minds on this. I like, it is interesting talking about spirituality and belief in America and just completely avoiding Christianity. But I think, I think when you go down that route, you, you risk, um, like, conflating a lot of stuff like christianity is very complicated and um it's it's difficult to handle and i think i think it kind of he, i think he was kind of worried yeah and sammy says that he he admits in um either the prologue or or the part right before he talks about the the jesus part of the book that it just it would it would bring too much in that he didn't he didn't want to really talk about yeah and I think it's just not that relevant to the to the aspects of America that he wanted to talk about because yeah. Christianity is its own whole thing. And I mean, that's what's ironic is in a book called American Gods, he wasn't really interested in talking about religion in America at all. Right. He doesn't care at all about religion in America. He cares about America and that he's telling a story about America using the lens of what if there were all these old gods from the old countries and yeah. the old gods themselves are a metaphor for just immigrants that they're, they're the, the kind of the pure form of, of these immigrants that came to the country. And, you know, you could even say this isn't a good country for gods is a metaphor for like, this isn't a good country for, for cultures. Like it, it kind of, right. kind of chews up these immigrants when they come in and, and shoves them into that melting pot, which, you know, it's it's sort of at least when I was in school, it was viewed as like a pro-social thing. We're going to we're going to turn everybody into Americans, but it's not necessarily yeah. fun to be thrown into a melting pot. I mean, that's it's kind of strange that they use that metaphor. Now that I think about it uh, since, since that means that you get melted. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right for for a a country without any national religion or national language we um there is an expectation of immigrants to this country that they are going to assimilate them that they are going to um abandon their culture and pick up ours which is just an amalgamation of a bunch of cultures anyway so exactly yeah yeah i mean i understand why th that's not satisfactory to you sergey i, I the the show does deal with jesus and i think the way the show deals with it is interesting but I completely understand why why Gaiman didn't want to go there, and man, um, yeah, I think it would have been it would have been. <laughs> I think it would have removed focus. The I think it would have taken the conversation around the story and removed it from where the, he wanted the focus. For I mean, just for people who may not have had access to that Jesus chapter, um, or it's not even a chapter; it's a short section. Yeah, he he talks to Jesus, and Jesus is basically like. He, he observes like Jesus is kind of living in like fine, you know, a, a, a fine establishment of, of a place. And he's like, oh, you're doing well for yourself. And Jesus is like, yeah. Um, but when, when you, you when so many people believe in you and they're actually worshiping so many different facets of you, you kind of spread out. You're too many things to do to too many different people. And uh, you're no longer you're no longer coherent and thus you can't really be powerful in the same way um uh which is which strikes me as true because it's it's like nobody's gonna nobody nobody sacrifices to jesus i don't know right. is, is that what i is that what i mean to say like like everyone like a lot of americans take their religion seriously but not not as seriously as as they took in the old days, even though we think of we think of religion as being this very powerful force in our culture, uh, it's pretty watered down, frankly. <laughs> yeah, and it's so like I mean, like the idea of belief that we talked about. Everyone's religious, like everyone has a different. Christianity is so broad that you could talk to five different Christians and they would all give you a different interpretation of the same thing. The rituals are so Americanized that 
like the biggest the two of the biggest christian holidays are commercialized secular holidays um and i i don't know any other religion that 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 is true yeah i i I think i think i agree yeah i agree completely like if you were gonna do jesus and christianity then you would you you'd have to go whole hog you'd have to talk about like you just said christmas you know yeah i mean they, they they the only time they touch on jesus in the book is around easter right and i think that's so clever that like easter is this person that's like actually living in in luxury because people are still celebrating easter but it's like they're not really celebrating you like the the original meaning of easter is does no one knows yeah exactly even the pagan yeah who who should be the one who the the one the one person wednesday happens to find (laughs) that should that should know exactly what the origin of easter is has no idea yeah yeah um, I will say that the show takes that idea of the broad, like all encompassing Jesus and makes it much more literally manifested. Like in the show, there are like a hundred Jesuses and each one is um, a, a different version of Jesus. Like there's the one that's the, the very European looking Jesus who has light brown hair and like, he looks like a white dude. Um, there's a Jesus that looks like probably how Jesus actually looked. There's a Mexican Jesus. There's an Asian Jesus. It's like the reflection of how everyone worships a different facet of the idea of Jesus creates different Jesuses. And I think that's a very clever way of, of exploring that. And I wonder if Gaiman had thought of that, if he would have included it. But I still probably think no. I think it's 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 adding too much at the expense of what he wants to talk about. Because I, you know, we've talked about how this book sprawls. I think it's probably good to come back to that here yeah. at the end. Um, and and I think what uh, something that Sergey says in in the chat is they really like a lot of the scenes and short plot threads, but but aren't really engaged by the overall plot. And I think like that's that's one of the advantages of a book that sprawls is that you can get into these like little little narrow paths of story where you're you're really enjoying like a conversation in a car between two characters and really doesn't like like you could just cut it out like you really could just cut out the scene and you would lose nothing in terms of does this have ramifications to the plot but what you would lose is well that was an enjoyable scene yeah and this book is full of those, absolutely full of those enjoyable scenes. It's just when it, when it all comes together in the end, you're kind of like, oh, that was it? Yeah, um, exactly. It, it is a book that works wonderfully in the micro and it kind of falls apart in the macro. And yeah. I, I love the micro so much that I, I can't, like, I love this book. I love this book so much. But, I mean, I will not argue with any criticism that says the, uh, the movement of the overall plot is paced weirdly and doesn't pay off super well and um, isn't, isn't particularly engaging. I completely agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my favorite things are, are indeed things that sprawl, but, but then finish strong. And those are, those are rare. And that's why yeah. they're, yeah. that's why they're my favorite. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's very hard to do. And, but yeah. I, I, like, I think this is a common thread with, with Gaiman though. I mean, you, you talked about the comparison to a, uh, uh Good omens. Um, good omens. It, the, this is it, the, you can def, you can definitely reading good omens. You can tell that that Pratchett wrote a lot of that book, but um, because this is doesn't have his kind of silliness in it, but um, the the very kind of abstractness is very similar to that as well. Absolutely, yeah. I, I could almost reading this, comparing it to that. I was like, ah, yes. Now I have a better sense of what Gaiman probably wrote in that yeah. book. I want to read more Gaiman, though. I actually, he wrote, it's not a sequel to this, but he wrote a book called Anansi Boys, which is about uh, Mr. Nancy's children. And that's a really cool story, too. It's it's pretty short. I read it in a couple days, and it's just like an exploration of that character. And, and it, it explores the power of story a little bit more, which makes sense coming from a character named Mr. Nancy, who, like, was all about stories. Like, he's the god of, the African god of storytelling. Um, so... It's 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 pretty good, cool. and it, it's much unlike American God. It's much more uh, satirical. It's much more light lighthearted and goofy sided than this was. Okay, yeah, I, I've uh, I've known about that forever, but I've never read it. So yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll check that out. Cool. All right. Any uh, more questions before we wrap this whole thing up, guys? 
we've gone long, but I like this conversation a lot. And, and I still, the thing about this is I think we talked about a lot of stuff, but I still don't feel satisfied. Like I said, we could do 10 two hour episodes uh, about this, this book. And I probably would still have the stuff to talk about, but we got to call it somewhere. All right. Well, while we are waiting for the questions to roll in, let's talk about next month, Matt. All right. Talk about what we are doing. Um, so next month is a little different because I don't know if you guys know, one of our patron level rewards um, is if you donate at our top tier level, you get to pick the book for one of the, our book club months. And so we had our patron Dark Glass who donated at that level. And instead of picking one book, he wanted us to... Um, he wanted to to nominate six books and then let people vote on them like we normally do. So that's what we did. And the book that won is... What is it, Matt? You want to read it? It's The Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie. Yeah, so not a controversial book at all. No. Um, this was the book that got the fatwa on Salman Rushdie. Yeah, so we're so... going to wear masks when we do this one, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about this. I've never read this book. Um, of course, I've heard about it. I think everyone's heard about it. So I'm really excited. I'm really excited to to dive into this one. There was, I mean, every single book on the list that Dark Glass nominated for us was something I had never read before. So I kind of like, even though we could only have one winner, I kind of wrote down all those books and I want to get around to them. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited about this. Yeah, I'm very curious. I, I somehow know nothing about this book, despite being aware of all of the uh, for uh, surrounding it. Yeah, yeah. I know that it pissed off a lot of Islamic people. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the uh, the leader of Iran did not like it. That's yeah. what I know about it. That's it. So, yeah, it's going to be good. Um, that will be... I didn't change this. So it's going to be Friday, July 27th at 9.30 p.m. Central Time. So it'll be the last Friday in July. Um, right back here on this channel, we'll be talking all about it. If you guys have any questions or comments or complaints or anything, uh, just reach out to us at dailyplanetfilms at gmail.com or on Twitter at dailyplanetfilms. If you have anything you want us to specifically talk about with this book, you can send it in to us there and uh, we can bring it up as we as we create the um the slides for it and everything so so do that don't feel free we yeah i know what you guys think um yeah if, if you like what we do here at the daily planet and want to see more of it head on over to our patreon at patreon.com slash daily planet films and consider donating a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford you'll get access to our private discord server as well as the ability to vote for which books we cover on this show and tons of other cool benefits so go check that out all right guys that's it for us this month. Enjoy the reading. I have oh, like five books I'm going to try to read before I get to the Satanic Verses um, to keep up with my goal for reading this year. So happy reading, everyone. And we will see you next month. Hooray. Yay. I'm stopping the recording now. Me too. That was fun, guys. I've never read Stardust, actually. I need to get around to that. I like the movie. I've seen the movie, yeah. I actually do like it. I mean, it's it's lighthearted. It, it reminds me of like Princess Bride. It's it's just fun. Mhm. Mm <laughs> Jesus wasn't white. Sorry, Sammy. I I hate to break it to you, but no. I've never read Sandman either. I feel like I should read that. That's a comic, though, right? A graphic novel, Scott. It's a comic. Like, why are we gonna try to make them sound fan fancier? Uh, Just. I, I'm. I've, I've, I was remembering the story that Gaiman told, at some interview or something, where someone was like making fun of comics, and and then he was like, and then he revealed that he was Neil Gaiman, and the guy was like, <laughs> "You wrote Sandman," and 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 then he's like. I don't know. I'm I'm getting this thing out of order, but he's like, that's that's a graphic novel, not a huh. not a comic, Mister. Oh huh, yes, well, yes. Never have pride in your medium. Just call it what it is. It's a comic book. Yeah. Um. Thanks, Sammy. Yeah, I I like the reorganization too. Um. I was supposed to get my new desk on Monday, but they called me yesterday and said it won't be here till next Thursday. So, 
It's a bummer. I was looking forward to the new desk. I'm going to turn. Else, when you hear kobold, does anybody else think of like a dog man creature that lives in a warren? I think of uh, EverQuest. Yeah, me too. <laughs> turning my air on because I got two texts from my wife saying, are you done yet? Please turn the air on. Do you need the um, file tonight? No, not tonight. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll edit it sometime tomorrow. Okay. Oh, man. All right. Um, how do you will, you... will you sometime tomorrow go into this video and edit out the beginning yeah. and the end and make sure. it better? I don't know yes. how to do that. Hopefully we didn't run too long because sometimes it, anyway, yeah, I'll do it. It's, okay. it's easy. Yeah. All cool. right, guys. Uh, I think we're going to, we're going to call it here. I'm out of words. I said so many <laughs> words. I can't think anymore. Yeah, me too. Thanks for All hanging right. out guys. It was fun. Yeah. I love, I love doing these. I really do. Book club is it's my favorite Friday of the month. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Oh, wait. I did the wrong order.